Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 11332 in the name of Fergus Ewing on supported businesses. I'd invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And, Minister, if you are ready, I would call on you to speak for 14 minutes or thereby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On the 27th of November 2012, this Parliament debated the imminent sale or closure of Remploy's enterprises in Scotland. At the time, this involved nine factories employing over 250 disabled people and three CCTV contracts with a further 29 staff. During that debate, members spoke of their concern for the staff involved and their disagreement with the UK Government over a process that threatened all of these jobs. Presenting officer, few spoke more passionately than our much missed colleague, Helen Eady, representing her constituents in the Cowdenbeath factory. In addressing Parliament, Helen asked that we think about what we could do to help not just Remploy, but the other supported businesses in Scotland as well. Helen was right on that day to encourage us to look more widely than the immediate threat to Remploy jobs and businesses. Today, I want to update Parliament on that very matter. The work of the Scottish Government since 2012 to encourage and enable the development of the remaining supported businesses in Scotland. And first ask ourselves the question, why supported businesses in Scotland are so important? Earlier this week, uh, Presiding Officer, I had the pleasure of visiting Haven in Inverness, and I understand that David White from Haven is here in the gallery witnessing the debate, along with a number of colleagues from the sector. Inverness is one of the Haven sites that operate across Scotland, and over the last two years I visited many of Scotland's supported businesses, and prior to their closure I visited a number of the Remploy factories. What I found in Inverness this week was what I find in all of these sites, dedicated staff working hard to deliver high quality products. Indeed, it's my reflection, Presiding Officer, that very often people with a disability work perhaps even harder than those without a disability, and in many cases have a far lower absentee rate through sickness or illness from work. Such is their determination and pride in what they do. When I undertake these visits, I struggle with the perception that some observers have or have had in the past that these are no more than sheltered workshops uh, that bear little resemblance to real working conditions. That is plainly not the case, as I think members across the chamber understand. And I challenge anyone feeling that way to visit the RSBI in Glasgow or Dovetail in Dundee to see for themselves how the businesses function. There are 20 supported businesses in Scotland. There are 900 employees. Over 700 have a disability. Uh, and we all have a duty and a desire to do everything we can to support these businesses. Uh, they are an important part of the landscape of support available to help disabled people find sustained, fulfilling and work opportunities. I'm delighted that my colleague Michael Matheson is going to close the debate tonight because, of course, he has responsibility uh, for the wider issue of disability and the wider issue of supported employment for people with a disability. But we all want to work together to sustain these businesses, the supported uh, businesses, and help them expand in a way that is commercially viable. So what have we done, presiding officer, since the debate in 2012? I've been clear from the outset that the ambition of the Scottish Government is that we have a commercially viable range of supported businesses operating across Scotland. Since 2012, Scottish Government staff have, in partnership with the businesses themselves and a range of external organisations, undertaken a significant range of work assisting the businesses in becoming more sustainable. And these are successful businesses. It's very important to understand that. They are turning over £33 million a year. These are not hobby businesses. These are not amateur businesses. These are professional, high-quality businesses that we are all determined to support. And changing perceptions, therefore, within both the public and private sector is part of our task. I've taken a strong personal interest in these developments and felt that it would be useful for Parliament to have an opportunity to debate these matters today. 
Uh, I convened a supported business advisory group, uh, which met on several occasions. This group included representatives uh, from the trade unions, uh, and uh, I'd like to add my thanks to Lynn and, and Phil, Lynn Turner and Phil Brannan from the trade unions who played such a, an excellent part in the proceedings and regularly brought us back down to earth about the reality faced by the people that work in these businesses. Also represented were Just Enterprise, the Scottish Enterprise, the British Association for Supported Employment, whose representative Alistair Kerr is also, I, I am inf informed, here today witnessing this debate, along with representatives of the third sector and local government. And that work has been instrumental in shaping the actions by the Scottish Government, deciding together from people who are closest to the people involved, presiding officer, what best we can do and what best we can do in a practical sense. Now, and procurement plainly is extremely important. And in 2012, Parliament was clear in demanding action to enable supported businesses to access more public contracts. Since that time, we have begun to transform the way that buyers perceive supported businesses via a number of proactive steps with a view to increasing the commitment of public bodies to buy from them. Uh, I lack the time to go through every individual action taken, but there are key steps that we have taken to raise awareness uh, and also to make it easier in practical terms for public bodies to procure from supported businesses. Yes. Jenny Mara. I thank the, the Minister for giving way, Presiding Officer. It is my understanding that since we were debating the procurement bill earlier this year, only an additional four contracts have uh, been awarded by public authorities uh, to supported businesses in Scotland. I believe there are still scores of, support, of public authorities who are yet to award even one contract to uh, a supported business. What is the government doing to, uh, to encourage this? The Minister? Well, I, the, there were two parts to that. I do not accept the premise of the first part, and I'm coming on to address the second part. In October 2012, Nicola Sturgeon, Deputy First Minister, launched the new National Framework Agreement for supported businesses, making it easier for public bodies to access goods and services that Scottish supported businesses can offer. The Framework Agreement and other Scottish Government initiatives within the public sector in the last year have provided around £2.7 million of contracts for supported business. £2.7 million worth of contracts from the public sector. Now, this is promising, but yes, we need to do more. That we accept. With the support of other Scottish Government ministers, I have, in order to seek to ensure that we do more, met with a number of public bodies, including the NHS, the Prison Service, Police Scotland and the Scottish Futures Trust. Alex Neil and I launched a new supported business directory in January of this year. Here it is. Uh, it uh, gives details, presiding officer, of the 20 supported businesses in Scotland. The value of this, and of course it's online as well, is that this means that those involved in procurement in public bodies have a ready access to what is available. Uh, now, in response to one of the points made in the Labour Amendment, which I regret we cannot accept, uh, plainly, to impose a duty on 100 pub 118 public bodies to procure purchased goods or services uh, which, which they may not need, because there is a limited range of goods and services supplied by supported businesses, does not really seem to me to be a very practical suggestion. Uh, well, okay, if you... I, th I think the Minister is, is misleading the Chamber slightly with this. He knows as well as I do that there is a supported business in Bruce Crawford's constituency that is manufacturing workwear uniforms and that every single council in this country has to buy workwear uniforms. So to say that supported businesses are producing things that public authorities may not need is simply not the case. Can the, will the Minister care to clarify that for us? Minister? Well, um, Ms Mara uh, is making an entirely different point. The point I made is that she says in her amendment there's 118 public bodies and they must all issue one contract. There are 20 supported businesses. They operate in a variety of fields. But there will be some public bodies that do not need some of the goods. I was not talking about local authorities. I was making the point there's 118 public bodies and in her amendment she says they must all procure business from supported businesses 
but some of them will not need any of the goods or services referred to. Of course, workwear is something that many individuals will require, but that is an entirely different point. Let me make some more progress, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, well, all right. Brian. Just, uh, just as a matter of fact, though, out of the 118 public bodies, how many currently don't have or haven't had a contract with a supported business? Well, Minister. The, uh, the, the vast number of public bodies uh, do uh, provide procurement to uh, the supported employment sector. The priority, presiding officer, and I hope that members would accept that this is not only reasonable, but practical and sensible, is that we focus on the major public bodies that have the major procurement, such as the NHS uh, and other bodies. And I'm going to come on to that. Uh, for example, thanks to the work that Alex Neil, Mr Matheson, and others across the Scottish Government have done. We persuaded the NHS uh, that there should be procurement of nurses' uniforms uh, to up to an annual value of £1.5 million. That was a major decision. We are extremely grateful to all of those in the NHS that were involved in this decision. It took a lot of time and consideration. These are not simple things, presiding officer. These are matters of business. And I think it's terrific in Scotland that through the efforts substantially of Mr. Neil, we were able, working with procurement officials in the NHS, to deliver a contract which has helped to secure the future of many of the ex remploy workers. Uh, so I hope that members will acknowledge that that and many of the other examples which we will provide represent very solid progress since 2012. In addition to the uh, supported business document, we have also produced a promotional DVD which has been produced and distributed to buyers and businesses themselves. The benefit of that is that they show for every procurement individual exactly what supported businesses are. Uh, one of the benefits of this debate is it gives us an opportunity to, no I won't, it gives us an opportunity to explain and get across what supported businesses offer to the public sector. And therefore, we have done that through this excellent document and through the DVD. And indeed, when I recently attended the, uh, the meeting of the SFT hub managers, one of the hub managers from the Murrayshire area said that the DVD said it all. Uh, so that's been extremely useful. We've also run two Meet the Buyers events this year in the Stirling Management Centre in the Scottish Prison uh, uh, Centre and also at the Procurex conference last week with John Swinney. Um, the success of Haven PTS, the new company formed following the sale of the two stage two Remploy businesses in securing agreement to become part of the supply chain for said NHS Scotland nurses uniforms has been truly significant. This has enabled presiding officer uh, staff, 22 staff, to retain their jobs. I had the pleasure uh, of attending with my colleague Alex Neil the occasion upon which we made the announcement with regard to this particular public procurement. I can say that it was one of the happiest of the several hundred engagements that I have attended as a minister. Uh, supported businesses have also been successful in securing contracts through the Commonwealth Games to the value of 914,000 Pounds. Uh, whilst winning new contracts is important, presiding officer, we also need to provide business support to supported businesses. I am pleased to say that Scottish Enterprise, Business Gateway and local authorities, Just Enterprise have all stepped up to the plate, offering business support to all 20 base members in Scotland. Uh, now, what will we do in the future? Firstly, uh, the work to support increased procurement and business development will continue. What supported businesses need is a concerted, long-term relationship with the government and the public sector authorities, not winning one contract per public body, not winning one-off contracts, but ensuring a steady flow of work which sustains them over the long term. That is the Scottish Government's approach. Now, I will continue to press the DWP for a discussion about their intentions regarding financial support given to supported businesses through work choice. Uh, this support 
is a, a payment of £4,800 per supported employee with a disability. It is absolutely essential, presiding officer, that this support is not withdrawn. And yet, it is under threat from the UK government. I have so far written on four occasions to DWP ministers requesting a discussion on this matter. The letters date back to November last year, uh, in March this year, uh, and so far there has been no discussion, no response, no assurance. Without this payment, the future of supported businesses is, I think, under serious question. I do hope today that we can unite behind the proposition that it is surely only fair to the 900 uh, employees in these businesses that they receive that support. Presiding officer, in conclusion, since 2010, disabled people have, I believe, suffered at the hands of the UK government through the introduction of a series of welfare reforms which have reduced their income and made some of the most vulnerable in our society feel vilified. Lord Freud's co comments at a, the recent Conservative conference simply serve to reinforce a view that the current UK government holds of disabled workers. The Scottish government does not share Lord Freud's views. Here, here. Here, here. We do not share those views which we regard as morally execrable. Here, here. We believe that we should recognise the varied employment support needs of disabled people and ensure that a variety of services and options, including supportive business, is available to help as many disabled people as possible into work. Many thanks. <clears throat> and I now call on Jenny Mara to speak to and move Amendment 11332.2. Ms Mara, you have 10 minutes, or thereby a generous 10 minutes. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I have to say um, I was very pleased to see this uh, debate on the government's agenda this afternoon, but um, I'm not pleased or impressed, even disappointed with uh, the Minister's um, first contribution this afternoon, because although I entirely and wholeheartedly agree with him, with his condemnation of Lloyd Freud, Lord Freud's comments to the Tory party conference just a couple of weeks ago. I think the minister is really guilty of passing the buck on this issue because I outlined to him in my interventions um, some of the figures and the sluggish pro uh, progress that the government is making on awarding public contracts uh, to um, public uh, procurement contracts to supported businesses in Scotland, but yet he is not prepared to put his money where his mouth is and actually legislate uh, to, make, um, to make these public authorities spend taxpayers' money on supporting um, these sheltered workplaces. And can I just, before I st start the substance of my contribution, I'll take you in a minute, Mr Crawford, if that's OK. But the Minister said that public authorities, we could not legislate that they could have one contract to a supported business because they may not need. Now, I would tell him that there are 118 public authorities in Scotland. And these are made up of local authorities, which he knows there are 32. They are made up of health boards and they are made up of quangos. I do not think it is beyond the minister's wit to pass an uh, amendment to the Procurement Act saying that the local authorities and the health boards, who he knows all have to buy workwear uniforms, perhaps not the Quangos, but all the local authorities and health boards, to mandate them to buy them from a supported business. He has put the nursing contracts to a supported business in Bruce Crawford's constituency, so there is no good reason why he can't put other contracts in the same way. Yes. Bruce Crawford. Look, I respect the intention behind what Jenny Mara is trying to achieve, President Officer, but can I ask her to reflect on the fact that if all these 118 business, um, public bodies awarded contracts, would the existing 20 businesses in Scotland have the capacity to pick it up? I don't think they would. And can I also point her to the fact that actually Glasgow-led council, North Lanarkshire-led council, Aberdeen-led council and seven other Labour councils in Scotland said there should be no such requirement in the procurement legislation? 
I think we should have the ambition to make them have the capacity because I'm sure Bruce Crawford would agree with me if it's good enough for his constituents, for disabled workers in his constituency, then it's good enough for disabled workers across this country. And he knows as well as I do, and I will go on to outline the figures today, the number of workers with mental health issues, with disabilities, who would benefit from work in a sheltered workplace supported by a public contract. Because, you know, presiding officer, it has always struck me as a bit sad and quite ironic that the Victorians had the foresight to open these businesses. But in our sophisticated modern world, we fail to find a way to make them sustainable and keep them open. We know that this government let the Royal Blindcraft factory in Edinburgh close just a couple of years ago after 200 years in operation. And just weeks ago, we saw the engine shed in Edinburgh announce its closure, a cherished social enterprise and supported business. And for the last 25 years, the engine shed has provided work-based training placements for young adults with learning disabilities and supported trainees. Its model is transformative. It has a well-documented success rate and it provides people with the skills and confidence to overcome barriers to work. And there's another example, presiding officer, the Royal Strathclyde Blindcraft Industries is an example of what can be achieved by supported employment business. RSBI is successfully diversifying its business into areas such as archiving and records management. It has over 200 employees and over 50% of whom are disabled people. It gives work experience and training to furniture manufacturing to school pupils from additionally supported learning schools in Glasgow every week during school term. It has also ring-fenced posts for returning disabled ex-servicemen and women. And some of these examples, I would say to the member Bruce Crawford, are good examples of how we can actually be ambitious and innovative and create the capacity for work in these areas. Now, many years ago, presiding officer, community, the union worked together with RSBI management through a difficult period of change in funding and restructuring the business. And at the heart of community, the union's work on supported businesses has been Robert Mooney, who joins us in the gallery today with his colleagues from RSBI. A disabled worker from Glasgow, a champion of sheltered workplaces, a long-serving member of community of the union, and I hope I can say a friend of mine, Robert has selflessly championed the cause of supported employment all his life, ensuring that opportunities for good work and fulfilling careers are available to disabled people. Because, presiding officer, disabled people are at least 30% less likely to be in employment than those without a disability. There is a moral imperative for government intervention to support disabled workers. But there, was, there is, I would say to Bruce Crawford, an equally strong economic case. We believe on the Labour benches that other supported employment businesses could be just as successful and profitable as RSBI. But it is clear that effective government action through procurement and proper legislative backup for that procurement is needed for that to happen. Now, disabled people and those with long-term health conditions, learning disabilities or mental health issues, face pronounced and complex barriers to sustaining employment in the mainstream jobs market. And many people who previously worked in sheltered workplaces, such as Remploy, which closed recently, have been directed towards supermarket work or similar jobs. But if I tell the Chamber that there were 8,000 applications for 350 jobs at an Asda store that recently opened in Dundee. Maybe that gives a picture of just how difficult that job market is. How do we turn this situation around? How do we provide sustainable employment for the disabled and those needing more support? I believe and Labour believes it is modern sheltered workplaces supported by public contracts. When the coalition government announced the closure of Remploy factories, I came up with a solution for the Dundee plant, which manufactured uniforms. A business structure of a social enterprise supported by local authority, NHS, police and fire uniform contracts. And I moved amendments to that effect, which were voted down by the SNP government in this chamber. 
They used Article 19 of the EU Public Sector Procurement Directive, allowing councils, governments and all these public authorities we've spoken about today to bypass the commercial tender process and reserve contracts for sheltered workplaces. The Scottish Government could, presiding officer, at the stroke of a pen, place its contracts for these uniforms in Scotland with sheltered workplaces all over the country. The SNP took this idea and made it happen in Stirling, but for some reason there was not the political will to make this happen from the SNP in Dundee. Now, Labour's amendment this afternoon revisits a debate we had during the passage of the procurement bill because we believe it is absolutely vital. We propose that each public authority in Scotland, all 118 of them, local authorities, health boards and quangos, award at least one public contract to a supported business. The SNP did not think this was a good idea. The Deputy First Minister argued against this proposal, suggesting that public authorities would be confused that they could only award one contract to a supported business and not more contracts. Not the strongest argument I've heard, but perhaps an argument nonetheless. So today, presiding officer, I'm running out of time, Minister, if I can Take just finish. Take the intervention if you want. Uh, will you? Okay. Minister? The Deputy First Minister argument was entirely different. Her argument was, why should only one contract be awarded? Well, he knows as well no. as I do that the amendment was not mandatory for it just to be one, but at least one. And I would ask him to perhaps bring back an amendment to the Public Procurement Bill saying at least one contract must be awarded by local authorities and health boards. You know, uh, presiding officer, as I was putting together the plan for Reemploying Dundee, I was in touch with private uniform buyers trying to encourage them to place contracts with supported businesses. And I do wonder what these private firms would make of the fact that there is no imperative under this government for local authorities to use public procurement to support sheltered workplaces. And indeed, these private companies were saying to me that they were looking to the lead of government to place these contracts before they did so themselves. Presiding officer, a Scottish Labour government would pass an amendment to the 2014 procurement bill requiring each public authority to place at least one contract with a supported business. But disabled workers across Scotland, Minister, should not have to wait until 2016. And so I ask the Scottish Government to support our amendment today and I move it in my name. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and I now call on Gavin Brown to speak to and move Amendment 11332.1. Mr Brown, a generous six minutes. Uh, Presiding Officer, thank you very much. Let me uh, just begin by moving uh, the amendment in my name. Uh, listening to uh, the Government opening today, I have to say I agreed strongly uh, with parts of Fergus Ewing's speech. Uh, where he talked about the dedicated staff, where he talked about the high quality products, where he talked about the lower absentee rates, not just within uh, supported businesses, but with, with disabled people working uh, anywhere uh, within the economy. He made a lot, I think, of very fair points and put his case forward in parts quite well. Uh, but I have to say I disagreed equally strongly uh, with other points that he made, and I'll come on to those later. Let me first of all say where we agree with him then. The idea that there is an economic and indeed a social value for supported businesses, I think, is right. The idea of the hard-working and quality products, that I've, as I just touched on, I think we agree with. And we certainly welcome the idea of any uh, supported business enhancing their commercial viability so that they are sustainable, not just in the short to medium term, but in the long term for those who work there. And I think I'd even be happy to give praise to the Scottish Government for uh, some of the work they've done in this area. And in particular, I think the minister himself, uh, he said he's taken a, a strong personal interest in the subject. And I think that is true. I think he has. And I think a number of the actions that he has taken personally it can be commended uh, and we'd be happy to support. In particular, uh, the steps to raise awareness, in particular, the framework for supported factories and businesses and also the directory of supported businesses in Scotland. Um, However, though, one should not be complacent, and I think that's where I think the Scottish Government does need to just answer some of the questions that have been posed and think very seriously about some of the policies that they espouse. And I think the first one I want to touch on there is their one contract policy, the idea that every uh, public body within Scotland should have at least one contract with a supported business. This was a, a policy set in 2009, Deputy Presiding Officer, 
And when the policy was set originally, the achievement or the policy was meant to be achieved by the end of 2010. So at the time, the government was giving, I think, a year and a half for the wheels to turn and for public bodies to grasp that policy and to award a contract. And the reason I asked the question in the intervention that I did was to find out exactly how many of these public bodies currently do not have or have never had a contract with a supported business. I think it's a perfectly fair question. I think it's quite an important question to ask and one to answer. And I was a little uh, disappointed that the minister uh, wasn't able to give a direct answer to that question. I'd, uh, I'd happily hear the answer either from him or any other uh, speaker in the government later on in the debate. The reason I ask is because according to the SPICE briefing in advance of this debate, there was an FOI request earlier this year. Uh, I'm not clear in which month, but in that FOI request, uh, the answer given was that 44 public bodies out of 118 uh, didn't uh, at that point meet the policy aim. And I suppose what I was trying to establish was, is that the current position or have things moved on at all? Or have they moved on rapidly uh, since that position? I'll happily give way to, to Chick Brody. Of course, you know, the, the, the outcome that we uh, expect to work towards is 118. Do you accept in in the commercial practice that you can't just suddenly switch on 118 businesses. So 44 is one step along the way to what uh, I believe will be an achievable objective. Gavin Brown. I was asking a far simpler question than that, Deputy Presiding Officer. F five years into the policy, I was simply asking what is the actual number of public bodies today that haven't endorsed that policy? Because we hear from the Minister that some of them might not need it. Well, if we have public bodies that don't need these services, why is the policy there? If they genuinely don't need them, but I would challenge that. I suspect when I look at the, what are described as lots in the government's own document, there cannot be many public bodies in Scotland who don't need either furniture or document management or textiles or signage. There may be one or two, but I'd be surprised if there are dozens of public bodies who don't need any of those services at all. So the idea that you're happy to give away. I mean, I'm sure Mr Brown will be aware of, of the interchange between the Deputy First Minister, I think it was Mr Griffin, on the committee in relation to the procurement bill. And I think it's important just to, to restate that for the record, presiding officer, uh, because what the Deputy First Minister said was, and this is now part of the procurement legislation, that every public body must consider whether they are able to use supported businesses and report in their annual reports what the outcome of that consideration has been. The onus is not an arbitrary imposition that everybody must purchase goods or services whether or not they need it because every public body is different, varying from the NHS to very, very small public bodies indeed that have got limited procurement options. The obligation is on public bodies, public bodies to consider whether they should and have the need for supported businesses, goods and services, and to demonstrate that they have so considered that on an annual basis. That seems to me the important thing, uh, and I hope that Mr Brown will recognise that that is the sensible and the correct approach to take. In the generosity of your time, I'll give you a little more time. Uh, for I'm grateful, President Officer. I mean, in, in a way, the Minister makes my point for me there. Because of all the uh, points he put in place, he should be able to easily and simply answer the question, how many public bodies do not have contracts? That was a simple question. He intervened for about a minute, and not once did he mention the number. So let's see from the Scottish Government. I've, pra I've been happy to praise them in the opening remarks of my speech, but I think it's an important question. Are they tracking this? And do they also note the value of the contract? Are, so one or two of the contracts you mentioned were pretty big contracts, but are those outliers? Are other supported businesses getting minuscule contracts, or are they all getting reasonable sized contracts? Do the Scottish Government look at which body specifically could do more? And what approach do they take to those that don't have a contract? Is it talked about? Is it a slap on the risk? Is there any kind of uh, discussion about it at all? Or is it something that isn't? Uh, mentioned between uh, supported businesses and the Scottish Government. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'll, let me just close shortly then. The other area where I disagreed strongly with the Minister, and which I'll uh, certainly return to in closing, is this. The Minister said directly he wants to help as many disabled people as possible getting into work. I agree with that. 
That is what we should all be aspiring to, and that, I believe, is what the coalition government is trying to do too. The SACE review, which was a serious piece of work, came up with the conclusion that the UK government approach ought to be allowing the funding to follow the individual, mm. to give them greater flexibility, greater choice, and ultimately to help far more people into work, as opposed to funding directly institutions. I will return to that in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you for the uh, additional time. Thank you. Meantime, and we now move to the open debate, and I call on Chick Brody to be followed by Hans Alamalik. Six minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, uh, just to recant what um, Mr Brown said, that we are here to help those with uh, disabilities. Um, and I'm delighted to speak in this debate, as I was in the 2012 debate, uh, and of course support the motion. Uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to recognise the role that the Minister himself has played in brokering not just the post uh, Remploy deals, but in his, uh, his attendance to this matter generally. Uh, Presiding officer, as inventory and purchasing manager of the NCR in Dundee some years ago, many years ago, a company, I have to say, that was a real, had a real community ethos uh, as one of its founding principles uh, under Nelson Kahn was a joy to work with and was involved directly, I was involved directly and indirectly with Remploy in Dundee. Uh, they made at that time uh, cable assemblies for electronic accounting machines, which dates the, 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 the involvement, and computers. It was never seen as a, a company of the disabled, but rather one uh, as a, uh, of a productive company whose employees had varied disabilities. My colleague, uh, Dennis Robertson, was so right when he called in the debate that we had about accessible tourism just before the recess. Uh, he called for the change in the terminology that defines disabled people. They are not. They are people with a disability. Presiding officer, in the last tranche of Remploy closures, I, uh, with my colleague Gordon MacDonald, met with management and employees at Remploy in, in Site Hill, Gail, to see what could be done to save the organisation and to lend what expertise we could to that organisation. We also met with those that had achieved the security of a building a similar uh, a company in, in Wigan and saved their employee organisation there. To go around that factory, and it wasn't a factory, it was actually a, a community, a, an enterprise, a, a a social enterprise in the real meaning of a social enterprise, a, a, a name and a, you know, practice. And to be stopped by a Dan, I think that was his name, asking us to, pleading with us, to save his job, his work community uh, that he knew was threatened uh, with closure. We left that factory consumed with an anger, an anger that was only further fueled by our meeting with the Tory Employment Minister of the time, Esther McVeigh, who came to Holyrood and who, it seems, whose aspirations for betterment appear to be hers and hers alone and not for those with disabilities that she claimed she had come to speak to. I often wonder, what begets these Tory ministers who suggested icy lack of caring and compassion and a promise of helping people when in fact the promise is, or seems to be, me first, Jack. There are 20 supported businesses in Scotland, as has been said, presiding officers, businesses that, with sensible intervention, could and will play a role in the public and indeed the private sector. Profitable, I believe, sustainable and desirable. There is no reason, no reason on earth that the capabilities of Remploy at the Gail Site Hill site, for example, in documentation archiving at the point of closure could not and should not have been uh, 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 the foundation and the base of working with the NHS boards, the police service, Transport Scotland, the local authorities, libraries and so many other bodies in providing what they were already doing and doing successfully, which was digitised archiving. The cost saving would have been immense, uh, as would be the appropriate data protection needs because of the reduction in communication links. But no, they were closed. And happily, Red Rock, uh, who have now uh, uh, transferred that activity to Hillington, have at least uh, saved some jobs in that area, if not in Edinburgh. So 20 supported businesses employing 900 people 
of whom 700 have some form of disability. A turnover of £33 million per year. High quality products in all cases married to customer commitment. Uh, it is not just about presiding officer creating more of them, but we should look at the, uh, the role and support the role of the, the Minister's Business Advisory Group, which embraces the trade unions, COSLA, the private sector and many others. They all can help us uh, develop and create, given the timescales of involvement and engagement by the public and private sectors to create uh, more and build those that are already in existence. And we should consider the creation and further development of social enterprises in which those with a disability have a stake, and not just a job stake, but a real income and earning stake, and encourage them with appropriate business support to engage profitably with the public sector buyers to secure contracts. Contracts under, as has been mentioned, the public procurement provision, the sustainable uh, procurement action plan, and also to operate within the EU Article 9 reg uh, procurement regulations. We must not, we must never subscribe to the Friday, I'm sorry, I'm almost finished, to the Freudian McVeigh principle that those with a disability have lost their jobs will find another within the wider jobs market. At the level required, at the level required, they didn't and they haven't. It's a nonsense that the employment rate for those with a disability in Scotland in the second quarter of this year was 43.3% compared to those that are not disabled with a proportion of 80.6%. And finally, I say this uh, to the party uh, in turmoil on these benches. When those of our countrymen and women with a disability, those lucky to get some employment and those without, go home and sit uh, at home to watch the news, what do they see? A replacement of the DLA by, by the dreaded PIP that will reduce their uh, aggregate disability benefit expenditure in Scotland by £300 million per annum by 2017-18. Or 100,000 people of working age with disabilities to lose some or all of their disability benefits by 2018 with a loss of £1,120 per year. So, presiding officer, I have to ask, is this what we have come to? Is this what the UK government has come to? Instead of helping those with disabilities to climb the ladder with the creation and the hope of a job and security, what we have is the Freud, McVeigh, her predecessors and successors having the Tory principle of pull up the ladder, Jack, I'm all right. Well, not in our name. We will help those with disabilities you're retaining the welfare form uh, cuts uh, 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 in, in Westminster. Georgia, close, we will help those with disabilities on a journey that makes them valued in the factories, in the offices, in the commercial marketplace. They should know that, at least in this place, they are highly valued. Many thanks. <clears throat> and there is a limited amount of time for interventions to be made and taken, should members so wish. Um, I now call on Hans Malik to be followed by Maureen Watt. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, Presiding Officer. It gives me pleasure to speak on the topic of supported businesses as many disabled persons face practical and complex barriers to keep sustained employment. For example, stigma and discrimination or lack of confidence and skills result in low level of employment. Why should that be? Only 46% of working age disabled people are employed compared to 76% of the general working age population. In addition, 10% of unemployed disabled people have to be out of work for five years or more compared to 3% of non-disabled people. The question must be asked why. I wholeheartedly agree with the principle of supportive employment. It has the principles to support disabled people when entering employment. Jobs should be integrated in the work environment and the job holder should always be paid a full rate for their work. I am keen to see future development for more flexible policies that go beyond the basic framework. But sadly, the SMP government 
commitment to supportive business has not come up to mark. Ramrod was forced to close a factory in north of Glasgow in 2012, and the Scottish Government failed to step in and support the factory, despite calls for help. Springburn lost the factory that helped disabled people, and 49 workers lost their jobs in the bargain. Now, some efforts have been made, I accept that, in respect to the Renro force closure of the five two-stage REM employment factories. The work of Heaven Protective Technologies Solutions goes some way to salvage the devastation that has caused by the closures in the first place. And I have to say that it's a bit late in the day to try to now claim the benefit after damage was done in the first instance. It needs to be understood that supporting businesses that have impact that cannot be calculated or should not be calculated only in pounds and pennies. If the public bodies do not give support businesses a chance in procurement, then who will? To date, 40 public bodies in Scotland are yet to award a single contract. That is quite frankly shocking. I accept the Minister's comments that more needs to be done, and I accept that, and I genuinely believe that he means it. However, I think if he does mean it, he needs to perhaps accept the amendment that has been proposed. That will go some ways in tackling the difficult situation that the disabled people find themselves today. I also want to point out to the, the Minister is that there's also an issue about the minority communities and how they're faring in all of this. I don't seem to understand and appreciate why the figures are not available currently uh, in this area, and I would appreciate some work done in that area so that we can tackle those processes. Presiding officer, the current framework simply holds together a system of supporting businesses that is no longer fit for purpose. A fresh look at the framework for supported businesses is required highlighting initiatives such as specialist social enterprises that could review the field of support of businesses is now overdue and welcome. But I think one of the main solutions in all of these issues are that we really need to understand our own communities and we need to understand the needs of people with disabilities. We need to understand the challenges they actually face it's very easy to publish glossy reports which doesn't actually deal with the difficulties that people face on a day-to-day -day basis. Life is becoming intolerable in many families because people are not getting the simplest opportunities. And I think it is important that the amendment that Jenny Mara has brought gives us a small hope, a light at the end of the tunnel that something can be done to support this community and support the organizations who are trying to support our disabled communities out there. A lot of the times, many people will simply don't understand the actual needs of the people who suffer the disabilities. We don't seem to understand the apprehension and the barriers that people face to come out and actually work in the first instance. People need to be handled and supported and I think it is the responsibilities of the government to ensure that if private industry or local authorities or other agencies are failing, that we provide that support and mechanism to support, help bring that about. The amendment goes some way in doing that, and I will ask the minister to consider the amendment with some serious thought. Uh, I, I do believe his heart is in the right place. I do believe that everybody in the chamber today has the right feelings for what we're trying to achieve here, but I think we need to be realistic and actually take on the amendment if we really mean what we say. Thank you, Mr. Providing Officer. Thank you very much. I now call on Maureen Watt to be followed by Mike McKenzie. A generous six minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to be taking part in this debate, both as a member uh, with a supported business in my constituency, but also as... Microphone. But also as convener 
of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee, sorry, presiding officer, uh, which of course scrutinised the procurement bill. And of course, it's apt that we're having this debate this week, um, uh, when Poppy week, the Poppy Appeal was just launched, because of course, one of the most high profile supported businesses, Lake De Hague's Poppy Factory. Presiding officer, in an ideal world, it would be great if everyone with a disability was able to, who was able to work was able to find work in a mainstream environment. But we know that just, that just does not happen, regardless of how well qualified or highly skilled they may be. And the stark employment rates bear that out, with the employment rate for people with disabilities being 43 0.3% compared to an employment rate for non-disabled people being 80.6%. And putting that in a more startling way, the unemployment rate for disabled people in Scotland is 14.6% compared to an unemployment rate of 5.5% of non-disabled people. That is why, like Chick uh, Brodie, I was so angry over successive Westminster government's decisions to close Remploy factories without a care or heed for what was happening to people who, in so many cases, as we know, are now left on benefits, declining benefits, stripped of their dignity and well-being. So I'm, so I'm proud of what this government has done to step into the breach to help as many people as possible, but also to promote the sector. And I know the Minister himself has been very involved and that he has the complete support of the First Minister, who himself became deeply involved in helping Glen Craft in my constituency. In anticipation of this debate, I popped into Glen Craft to get an update on how things are with them. I know that the employees are very pleased and that their enterprise has won a string of awards over recent months. Most recently, a few weeks ago, I watched them pick up an award at the Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce Business Awards. Glencraft is at last looking forward to moving into new premises, having reached an agreement with the Reg Vardy Company and the Council to move to re refurbished premises in the Langstracht in Aberdeen, regrettably out of my constituency, but into Mark McDonald's, but I'm sure I will keep uh, the links with them. They're currently looking to raise funds to fund the move, Minister, so if there are any sources of funding which might be able to help with that, um, I would be glad if you'd let me know. Um, Carl Hodgson of Glencraft had just been at the Procurex exhibition recently, and the first thing he wanted to make clear to me was that the government and senior civil servants absolutely get and encourage supported businesses and he welcomed the procurement legislation. And we've already seen the new Caledonian sleeper franchisee commit to procuring the mattresses for the beds from Glencraft. However, this support from the top, I think, has yet to be replicated throughout other public bodies. And it's well to reiterate Bruce Crawford's intervention that in consultation for the procurement bill, a number of Labour-led councils did not want to legislate to help uh, supported businesses. Glencraft is well supported by the oil and gas industry and privately owned local hotels and, of course, the general public. But there's no doubt that a contract with a public body would undoubtedly help. I think the requirements of the, the procurement bill are still very new to a lot of people in the procurement business, um, and many public bodies are still coming to grips with it. And it does require a change of mindset. It's so easy for procurers to go to large businesses who can provide a whole range of products. And it's difficult for supported businesses to engage and get into these big uh, suppliers. Uh, as these providers, th these businesses are looking for the cheapest goods so that they can increase um, their profit mar margins. Uh, procurers, especially in looking for sustainable procurement of goods, will have to start breaking up these large contracts into smaller contracts, and that will, I, I'm sure, help supported businesses. Yep. The member then think that it would be a reasonable suggestion that all local authorities, councils, all 32 of them, and the health boards should place at least one contract 
with a sheltered workplace who we know manufacture things like beds and uniforms that they all buy? Or in what? I wish it was as simple as Ms Mara tries to make out. And of course, there's nothing stopping councils at the moment doing that. But we haven't seen any lead on this from any of the councils. Indeed, as I've just said, that Labour councils didn't want it in the bill. Yeah. So she can't just stand up and keep repeating the same mantra all the time. She has to face reality. Supported businesses, as I've said, cannot compete on what is an uneven playing field. For example, Glencraft's advertising budget is £18,000 compared to a major bed provider who seems to be advertising on the television all the time, uh, who spent a whopping £22 million. But I'm so impressed with what Glencraft um, have done and are doing. 80% of their workforce have disabilities. And the Minister is right to say that um, they are very good at turning up to work and have lower uh, absentee rates, but it isn't without um, its challenges. And if the management are constantly looking for new avenues for their projects, for their product, and even getting onto the mail order sites of some major companies, which I hope comes off. And they also have local school, school children in for work experience. I'm so glad that the approach of the Scottish Government is so different from Westminster, and I think the future for supported businesses in Scotland is bright. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I now call on Mike McKenzie, to followed by Siobhan McMahon. Thank you, President Officer. I was very disappointed with Jenny Mara's speech that she not once, not once did she even attempt to place the blame for their employee closures where it properly belongs with the Tory Lib Dem coalition in Westminster. Because it's not possible to properly tackle this subject without placing it in the context of the UK government's austerity agenda. And we know that this is about ideology rather than finance because austerity is clearly not working and the test for this, the only test worth applying in financial terms is that George Osborne has missed each and every one of his borrowing targets. So it's not about finance, it's about ideology. And we heard much during the referendum campaign about the broad shoulders of the UK with the implicit suggestion that the big the rich and the powerful would help carry the burden on behalf of those who were less fortunate. Where are those broad shoulders when it comes to supporting those people with disabilities? And the closure of the employee factories was about nothing more than the vicious cutting of this failed austerity agenda, with the cuts falling as usual on those least able to bear it. No evidence here whatsoever of those broad shoulders we heard so much about. And all to make savings that look infinitesimally small compared to UK government borrowing, now around £1.4 billion. Certainly. Brown. Does a member then think that if he were to be in charge, should the money be taken away from individuals and channelled towards institutions? I'll, I'll come Mike to McKenzie. that just a wee bit further on in my speech here. And, but, President Officer, this goes belong beyond the ideologically driven finances of austerity because we know this from Lord Freud's recent Freudian slip where he suggested that people with disabilities should qualify for a lower level of minimum wage. We shouldn't forget this is the same Lord Freud who oversaw their employee closures. And he suggests, to answer Mr Brown's point, that his true agenda is a benign one and that he is merely trying to integrate those with disabilities into the mainstream workforce. But he surely realises, and Mr Brown surely realises, that not all people with disabilities can integrate into that mainstream workforce. What is to become of those people? What is to become of those... I've already taken one intervention, Mr Brown. And what is to become of those who lost their jobs in their employee closures? What is to become of those people who have lost their dignity and their confidence and who perhaps may find, never find another job? And what indeed is to become of these same people who face 
the perfect storm of welfare reform, once again bearing disproportionately on the shoulders of those who can least bear it. And just as damaging as the decision to shut down reemploy was the haste in which this was done, allowing no decent opportunity for business models to be adapted or for the Scottish Government to fully mitigate the damage done. And I know that the Minister's efforts in working to mitigate this damage have been unstinting and with some significant successes, given more time and a decent interval by the UK Government, I believe even more jobs could have been saved. I would commend also the Scottish Government's approach in encouraging procurement, which aims to set a level playing field for supported businesses. I am astonished actually at the Labour uh, Party's uh, proposals. They seem to wish the Scottish Government to impose centralised control on local authorities when almost always they argue that the opposite should be the case. And it has been argued that supported businesses can't compete on price. I'm not sure that this is valid, but what I am sure of is that they can compete on quality. They can compete in terms of community benefit and they can compete in terms of the public good. Presiding officer, this issue indicates clearly the difference between the two governments, our government in Scotland and that other one down the road. Because the Scottish Government has provided assistance to employ employees and to supported businesses. Not to swell the coffers of the Scottish Treasury or not to reduce the costs of, the Scottish, of Scottish welfare, but because it is the right thing to do. It does so with moral purpose and it does so with humanity, knowing there is a value beyond any that can be captured on a balance sheet. These are our Scottish values and this is perhaps the most important reason why this Parliament and this Government should hold and exercise more powers as suggested in our submission to the Smith Commission. Many thanks. And I now call on Siobhan McMahon to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I'm pleased to be able to take part in this afternoon's debate on supported business. As the Minister will know, this is a subject very close to my heart. Many of us in this chamber campaigned against the closure of the employ factories only a short time ago. We did so because we recognised the importance of these factories, not only to the disabled people they employed, but also to the wider economy. Our country is poorer as a result of the loss of such factories. One of the people who campaigned the most against these closures and was a champion of supported business throughout her time in politics was Helen Eady. On the 9th of November, it will be one year since Helen passed away, leaving many of us to feel her loss on a daily basis. However, it is during debates such as these that we feel her loss all the more. I am sure Helen, if here, would have delivered the most passionate and articulate of speeches, asking that the Government amend the Procurement Reform Scotland Act to require that all 118 public authorities in Scotland award at least one contract to a supported business. Although I do not have the same skills as Helen had, I ask the Minister to amend the Act in order that we in this Parliament can actively demonstrate our commitment to support to supported business throughout Scotland in a practical way. Of course, it is not only for the Scottish Government to commit to helping supported business, it is for our local authorities to do so as well. That is why I am immensely proud of North Lanarkshire Council, who have invested more than £500,000 in forming NL Industries to take over from their employ factory at Netherton. This has allowed the expansion of Beltane Products, a furniture and uh, refurbishing service, Beltane Products have previously employed 21 disabled people, but with the Council's investment, they have been able to expand this by adding seven former employee workers and three people from the Council's own supported employment service. The business have plans to add to this number as they continue to expand. As the Council leader, Jim McCabe, has said, it is an amazing thing to see people who thought they had no future working so hard to produce a fantastic standard of product. I am glad that North Lancashire have shown true leadership with regards to supported business, 
but it is deeply regretful that 40 other public bodies have yet to award one single contract to a supported business, and that is why we needed the Scottish Government's support for Mark Griffin's amendments to make a minimum threshold compulsory to ensure all public bodies issued at least one supported business contract. I urge them to rectify this mistake now and amend the Act. We, of course, know that supported business is not the only way to provide employment to disabled people. It is shameful that only 46 per cent of working age disabled people are employed, in comparison to 76 per cent of the general working age population. We also know that disabled people are twice as likely to live in poverty as non-disabled people. The Scottish Government's framework for supported business is a good start, but such a framework should address the wider issues disabled people face with regards to employment. In the Inclusion Scotland briefing for today's debate, they state that they would prefer disabled workers to be fully integrated into all employers' workforces by giving them the support they need and by removing the barriers they face, including the attitudes of employers and society about the capabilities of disabled people. I couldn't agree more. Many employers see disabled people as a potential problem in the workplace, rather than focus on the positives that person can bring. I was recently talking to a constituent who has autism and obsessive compulsive disorder. He told me that his disability means that when he begins a project, he stays with it until the very end and works hard to achieve everything that was required of him at the beginning. That type of dedication to one's workplace is priceless and should be viewed as such. I believe that the Scottish Government have missed several opportunities to address the problems many disabled people face when it comes to employment. I have spoken many times in this chamber about the lack of vision contained within the Youth Employment Strategy for Disabled People, particularly those with learning disabilities. I have also spoken about the complete lack of opportunities for disabled people in the Modern Apprenticeship Programme. From the 2012-13 figures, we can see that just 63 out of 25,691 that 0.2 per cent modern apprenticeships went to young disabled people. When we take account of all disabled people, this figure rises to 0.5 per cent. This is a national embarrassment, and yet I have heard absolutely nothing about how the government wishes to tackle this inequality in its own system. Furthermore, I laid several amendments on behalf of charities and organisations working with young disabled people to the Children and Young People's Bill regarding the need for support for those young people leaving school and transitioning either into further education or employment. I argued that we should have a mentoring system put in place to help young people in times of transition. Of course, all of my amendments were defeated at that time, but I agree with Inclusion Scotland, who say that the Scottish Government could lead by example by establishing internships and apprenticeships specifically for young disabled people in every government directorate. Every health board and local authority in Scotland could do likewise. I believe that this is an achievable ask, and I ask the Scottish Government to consider it seriously. As I said previously in my speech, supported business has a crucial role to play in the employment prospects of disabled people, but they are only one part of the solution. Of course, we should support them as much as we can, and that is why the role of procurement is so important. However, I would urge the Minister to take on board the suggestion by Inclusion Scotland, as those two will make a huge difference to the employment opportunities of disabled people going forward. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I now call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Cameron Buchanan. A very generous six minutes. Uh, the word very is duly noted, uh, presiding officer. Um, let, me, let me just start by saying that I think it's very clear from the debate uh, thus far that there is a pretty broad consensus, it may stop at the aisle along to my right, uh, that this is an important issue where we have shared objectives. If we differ, I think it's about means, not about objectives. And let me just commend two speeches that we've had so far that I think have best uh, illustrated that consensus and the nature of the challenge. And the most recent one from Siobhan McMahon, a subject she's taken close interest in over a period of time, while not necessarily agreeing with everything she said, no one who listened could doubt the commitment from Siobhan McMahon. And I thought Mike McKenzie uh, today uh, made an outstanding speech that, that, that captured the essence of the debate from uh, these benches. Now, the motion uh, that's before us from the government uh, talks uh, quite properly about 
about uh, enhancing commercial viability through business support and action to increase public and private sector procurement. Now, we've talked about the quality of the products that can be produced from supportive businesses, and that's correct. Um, very, very early in my married life, and I've now been married for 45 years, uh, the very first bed that we bought was bought uh, from Blindcraft. And it was an excellent product at an excellent price, and it was delivered uh, to us. And I'm sure many of us have had very good interactions uh, with supportive businesses at various stages in our life. Now, why did I go to Blindcraft? First of all, because I knew about them, and I felt that I wanted to support them. But also, economically, it made sense to go there, and I bought a good product. It's disappointing uh, to hear, as we have heard, that there's comparatively little money available to help these businesses market themselves. And I think that's uh, something we might all uh, ponder uh, from here on in. Profit. Let's just talk about what profit is actually is. It's really quite interesting, and Inclusion Scotland's uh, contribution to us as members in advance of the debate, they highlight, for example, in relation to the DWP's Access to Work Scheme, that for every pound the Access to Work Scheme, uh, the, the, the Treasury spends on that, they actually receive £1.60 in additional tax. So actually, as an intervention uh, by the DWP, it makes a profit. And I think that leads us from the particular to the general. And that is that when we support people who require a, su a supported environment in which to work, the odds are that the economics of that make sense. Because if we have people who have dropped out of the system, who because of lack of social contact, lack of income, lack of uh, being integrated into the wider community, require more economic and social support, the cost of these people rises. So there is actually a profit. You know, we don't have to be moral about this. It's almost certainly economically sensible. But the trouble is that this is being conflated into uh, all people who require any money from the state uh, are people who leeches on the state and must be cut to the bone when the reality is a proper economic look at this would come up uh, with a very different uh, view. Now, there are some interesting things as well that happen in supported industries. Uh, there are some of them, and I've been trying to look around the world, who are keeping old crafts alive. For example, in the town of uh, Soredi in France, uh, there is what is thought to be the last manufacturer of whips. Yes, I know we can all think of some uses for whips in this debate and many others. Um, and they are using local materials to do it, and they are a supported business. And often you get these little niches that are really of value and really of interest. So things are happening uh, all around the world uh, one way or another. Now, let me just uh, quote from the New Statesman. Uh, in 2013, and they make, they make one or two interesting observations in relation to uh, this subject. And the first one is perhaps we need to be slightly careful about when the reduction of the number of people employed in the supported business sector started. In 2008, the first round of closure started uh, under the Labour government with 1,600 workers uh, being given the boot at that point. And the DWP suggests only 200 of that 1,600 were successful in getting jobs, and that's five years later they're looking at. So it is a long-run problem, and I don't think you know, we should particularly point at any single individual or any single government. I think what's being done now is certainly not going to be helpful. Now, Jim Sheridan asked a question in the House of Commons in 2013, on the 4th of March, uh, about the £8 million that had supposed to be made available um, to ex-Rempoy people to find work or access benefits. And it does appear, both on Estimate V's answer, but more fundamentally on the work that Private Eye, 
uh, a print publication for which I have the highest regard, uh, that, uh, that it's unclear whether anybody got anything out of that, that uh, most of the money seems to have been spent on unpaid volunteering, work experience or coffee mornings. So even the money that has been available to support people in this position uh, uh, seems, on the basis of that, not to have been wisely deployed. Now, people with disabilities we meet them in our everyday life. I regularly go to a local cafe where some of the staff, a majority of the staff, are people with disabilities working not in a supported enterprise, but a supported environment within an enterprise. So there are many different models that will suit many different people. Now, the government and the government's uh, companies and agencies do do very well. And I particularly remember as uh, a minister uh, visiting Calmax office in Guruk and meeting Eric Ruthven, uh, who'd started working there in the 1990s, having come out of a supported environment. He's now a valued member of staff there. He's probably the best known member of staff of people who get the ferry at Guruk. And he is in receipt of an MBE for the charitable work that he's been doing in the local area. So we should never underestimate people uh, with disabilities. Now, let's just close, presiding officer. By thinking about companies, private companies, big private companies, small private companies, public companies, there is increasing pressure on companies in a number of ways to behave in moral ways. We're actually seeing increasing adoption of the living wage, for example, without legislative requirements. And that's good news. Corporate responsibility, social responsibility, is a thing that is debated in many boardrooms across these islands. This is the next subject that we should try and make sure is debated there. We could, of course, uh, do uh, what the Danes have just put into legislation, for example, in relation to the environment, where companies now have to give an environmental statement as part of their annual reporting. Uh, we could see that providing a, a useful thing here. And finally, presiding officer, just to address the 118, I've been racking my brains to see, looking at the list of the 20 supported businesses, what exactly the Water Industry Commissioner of Scotland would be able to buy uh, from uh, any of these 20 businesses. I'm sure very eager to do so. They've got a good complement of furniture that's relatively modern. I, if the presiding officer allows me, which he does, I will. Jenny Minor. No, officer, I think I made it clear to the Minister that what I was suggesting was that there was a mandate of at least one public contract to local authorities and to health boards, which we know buy uniforms and beds that are made by sheltered workplaces. If the minister would then like to maybe exclude quangos that he knows, like Scottish Water, who do not buy anything that supported businesses make, then that would be a decision for government. Finally, Mr Stevenson. Uh, Presiding officer, I'm not quite sure if I've been reinstated in a previous position because I appear to be being addressed as minister there. But let me reply anyway. Um, the amendment says 118. May I merely uh, suggest in the most kind way uh, that my colleagues in the chamber must proofread their amendments more carefully before submitting them, because 118 certainly includes the Water Industry Commissioner of Scotland. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible for them George at some future date, now, but I think if you were to make it a legal requirement, it would be a substantial difficulty. Presiding officer, thank you for the extra time. Thank you for your contribution. Um, and I call on Cameron Buchanan to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Uh, suitably and similarly generous time is available. Mr Buchanan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This afternoon, we've had a very informative discussion about Scotland-supported businesses. We all do have shared objectives, even if on this side of the aisle we differ as to the means. We are all agreed on the important role that they can play in boosting disabled people's quality of life. However, it is also apparent that if this sector is to make as much of a contribution to sustainable employment for disabled people as possible, there must be a greater focus on boosting employability in the mainstream workforce. I would first like to touch on some of the details of supported businesses in Scotland and the valuable role they have to play. As we've heard, there are 20 recognised in Scotland, which together provide sustainable employment for around 910 people. Of these, around 625 people are people with a variety of disabilities, very difficult to categorise. 
Furthermore, supported businesses in Scotland still offer training opportunities for more than 400 other individuals every year. Sustainable employment, where possible, is the best means by which disabled people can live independently and with a good standard of living. As a result, the presence of training opportunities within these businesses in Scotland should be warmly welcomed. However, recent figures put the employment rate for disabled people in Scotland at 44.3%. Needless to say, we all agree this is simply not good enough. In an ideal world, all disabled people who are willing and able to work would be able to find a job. But this isn't an ideal world, nor an idealistic one. And, it is highly, and it's a highly challenging aim to get everybody back into work who are disabled. Yet all efforts to get closer to it should be applauded. But in order to make larger steps, encouraging words need to be bolstered by concrete actions. In this respect, Scotland's supported businesses do set an example to follow. Yet in order to develop and expand the supported business models, we must first recognise its limitations and the challenges it faces. Without necessarily addressing all of these, it would be very difficult to achieve the progress that we desire. An important point I would like to make here is that in some cases the solution may be to have less active intervention from government rather than more. A case in point here is the perceived lack of readiness in some supported businesses to, complete, to compete commercially. Commercial viability should be welcomed where it is genuinely achieved. It is apparent that in some cases high levels of subsidy have actually protected these businesses from the genuine market forces and the real world, which may have detracted attention from business and also where det detracted attention from business such as marketing, product development, and indeed innovation. As an entrepreneur, I understand that subsidies should not be relied on, and these business skills are absolutely vital for two, in this sector for two stunning reasons. The first is that commercial skills are essential in the world of mainstream work. The, word for this, the world for, these, for which these jobs are meant to be operating for the employers the employment is in the open market indeed represents sustainable employment for disabled people in Scotland, a view that is shared by Remploy. Their chief executive, Bob Warner, said himself, there is now an acceptance that disabled people would prefer to work in the mainstream employment alongside non-disabled people rather than in sheltered workshops. And that, that, I think, is key. And that for the cost of employing a person in a Remploy factory, Remploy employment services could help four disabled people into work. This, I feel, is a telling indicator that the development of business skills must be treated as a priority. Certainly. Chick Brody. Thank you very much. Thanks for taking the intervention. If your premise is right in terms of Mr Warner's comment, can you explain why the, uh, the, the, the rate of employment of those with disabilities is almost half of those with no disabilities? Where is the incentive to help these into normal if I may put that word, normal workplace employment. Cameron Buchanan. My own feeling for that is I think it depends on the disability. It's very difficult to categorise disability. There are so many different types of disability, and I think that's the problem that they have. Certain people in Remploy find it very... can only use certain narrow jobs. Other people can do wider jobs. Remploy in, in employment services help people realistically and as a telling indicator sorry a telling indicator that the development of business skills should be treated as a priority that's the business skills not just uh, manufacturing skills and with large subsidies dominating the planning and the operation of supported businesses these vital skills are not being used or taught as much as they should be the second reason is that strong commercial skills must be developed in that is that dependence on subsidies is not at the moment a sustainable long-term course for supported businesses to wholly depend on. This is because funding for specific supported businesses is not guaranteed to cover, the cost, to cover all costs going forward. Programmed as, uh, sorry, programmed uh, all costs going forward. Programmed such as work choices currently provide £4,800 subsidy per eligible supported employee, in some cases which, hi help, which highlights that such programmes are critical to the financial sustainability of a number of supported businesses. As a result, it is not apparent that these businesses will need to be add to their income if they are to continue to provide great help for the disabled people in employment. And skills development for disabled people is essential. To add, to add to the, and diversify their income, supported businesses will need to increase their revenue from, in, from their revenue from business streams, namely the product and services 
um, sorry, sorry, namely the product and services from, uh, sorry, I repeat myself. And this is only possible to do on a substantial scale where the employees have the skills and experience to operate under the competitive market conditions. Therefore, I want to express my sincere hope that the operation of supported businesses will evolve not will evolve to the increasing sorry to the increasing in, to increasingly include working within market incentives given this need transitions will be required within affected businesses to ensure that their staff members are provided with skills development and wider business training as a result we must recognize that a significant challenge lays ahead for many supported businesses and this parliament should do all we can to ensure that smooth process so a smooth process evolves whereby employees do not lose out. Accordingly, Presiding Officer, I hope that Scotland continues to benefit from the contribution of supported businesses to our country, society and indeed economy, as the latest figures put their turnover at around 33 million per year. Furthermore, I hope this debate and the attention it brings will enable those businesses to deliver all the changes that they most importantly require and that their employees need in order to continue in a sustainable manner and prepare disabled people for the well-deserved security that they job deserve in a wider open economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Annabel Ewing to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to have been called to speak in this debate uh, this afternoon. And at the outset, I believe that it is important to recognise that the starting point in the promotion of opportunity for disabled people in the workplace must uh, always be what suits that individual best. So for many, mainstream employment, as it's termed, will be the best option. However, for some, supported business may be the only chance they have of getting a job. And hence, Presiding Officer, there must always be a role for supported employment. Otherwise, we risk closing the door uh, on dignity and hope for some of the most vulnerable members of our society. That said, it was, of course, extremely disappointing that successive Westminster governments pulled the plug on Remploy. Uh, and as was evident from the excellent contributions of many members during the two debates we held on Remploy in 2012 in this Parliament, the way in which the process was carried out by the current Tory Liberal Westminster Government left a lot to be desired. And indeed, a cynical person would suggest that there was from the outset a presumption in favour of closure with respect to all nine Remploy factories in Scotland, including in Leven and in Cowdenbeath. It has been important to note, therefore, the significant actions taken by the Scottish Government to mitigate, uh, certainly. Gavin Brown. To the member. Does the member then think that the current expenditure should move away from the individual back towards supported workplaces? Annabel, you well, I, I, I'm grateful for the member's intervention because I was going to get on to, to uh, later in my remarks to calling on the uh, member and his colleagues to assist with lobbying his chums in Westminster to maintain funding for the Work Choice Programme because of his argument is that the funding should follow the individual, not the institution. I am sure that Mr Brown will be supportive of those calls to maintain funding for the Work Choice uh, uh, Programme. But it's been important, I think, presiding officer, to note the significant actions taken by the Scottish Government to mitigate the effects of the UK Government's closure uh, uh, policy. Uh, for example, the Minister has outlined that we uh, saw established in November 2012 the Supported Business Advisory Group, uh, which the Minister convened and which he, he was at pains to stress provided real practical input and advice about what actions could be taken to help supported business. We also heard that uh, the uh, National Framework Agreement was established uh, also in 2012, which makes it easier for public bodies to buy from supported business. Uh, we saw reference to the launch of the Supported Business Directory, which showcases the range of capabilities of supported business in Scotland. And we also saw uh, earlier this year the, uh, a, a, a supported business development event uh, uh, being held, which gave a platform to supported business to raise awareness of the products that they can uh, indeed supply. All these actions are intended to provide for a sustainable future for supported business. And as the Minister said, the key issue here is that there is a steady flow of work available over time, and that is how we create a sustainable future. On the important issue of procurement, I uh, welcome the announcement uh, 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 earlier this year of the three-year contract issued by the NHS for the supply of workforce uniforms from Haven PTS Limited. And it is important to note that this work has enabled the company to take on uh, many uh, former Remploy employees, and I commend the efforts of all uh, concerned here. Uh, certainly. 
Jenny Mara. Thank the member for giving way. If she's welcoming the NHS placing this contradiction contract for nurses uniforms would she recommend to her government that they should go further and do the same with police fire uh, bin men cleaners uniforms across the country and well, well, Ewing. I, I, I'm uh, grateful for the member's intervention because it's very timely I was just actually going to get on to uh, the Labour amendment uh, presiding officer uh, and as I, I would say my colleague uh, Bruce Crawford uh, already pointed out in an intervention to Ms Mara it is indeed I think worth recalling uh, that during the consultation on the procurement legislation respondents were indeed asked if the current policy guidelines should be uh, made a statutory requirement that is to have at least one contract with the supported business and uh, as we heard the majority of respondents said no uh, and those uh, respondents saying no included Labour-led Glasgow City Council, Labour-led North Lanarkshire Council uh, and some seven other Labour-led uh, councils. So I would perhaps suggest gently to Ms Mara that maybe she would be better placed having a chat with her Labour, Labour Council colleagues to better understand their real life experience uh, from the front line on these matters. Uh, finally, uh, Presiding Officer, in concluding remarks, uh, I would I uh, hope that my call to Mr Brown to support the Scottish Government's um, uh, uh, funding for the Work Choice Programme uh, will be uh, uh, heard and that they will assist with the Scottish Government's efforts to, uh, to promote uh, the continuation of that funding. Uh, uh, the Tory member of the coalition, uh, UK coalition government at least are here today or some of them but we don't seem to have the junior members of the coalition, uh, the Liberals uh, and they have failed in fact to turn up to any debate that we've had in recent years on supported uh, employment and it is perhaps uh, a sad reflection of where the Liberal Party finds itself now uh, in Scottish politics that they don't see it as important to turn up to these important uh, debates. Presiding officer, disabled people are keen to work and to make their contribution to society. They want the dignity of employment and the hope that that brings. For some supported employment, as I said at the outset, is their only chance. And we must therefore recognise that and do all that we can to promote sustainable supported employment. That is all the more important, presiding officer, in these times of Westminster austerity and the dismantling before our very eyes of the welfare system that Westminster is currently engaged in. This is indeed a tale of two governments, and we here in Scotland utterly, utterly reject the not-so-noble Lord Freud's truly contemptible suggestion that disabled people be treated as second-class citizens in the workplace. What a disgrace that man is, presiding officer. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, before we move on, I'd just advise the remaining members who wish to speak that we do have some time in hand. I call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Richard Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I'm delighted to be able to speak in this debate today. I want to come on to the main body of the motions and amendments later, but I wanted to give you some personal reasons why I wanted to be involved in this particular debate. One of my earlier experiences in life in the civil service in the Scottish office um, and earlier in my career, I was an equal opportunities officer. And as part of that role, I was responsible uh, across the Scottish office to ensure that managers understood what disabled people required in the workplace, the aids and equipment that was available to help people perform um, was available to help individuals who were disabled give off their full potential, be the best citizens they could be in the workplace. I find that job very rewarding. Uh, and one of the most powerful lessons I learned from that, in order to create an equal opportunity for any individual, actually, on many occasions, you've got to ensure that they get an additional service to enable them to compete at an equal level. Very early lesson I got. Later on in my career, I became the, the, the council leader in Perth and Kinross. And one of the pleasures I had at that stage was helping to support the dovetail operation in Dundee, which was a, an amalgamation um, of, from the former Royal Dundee Blind Craft Products and the Lord Robert workshops that had come together in Dundee. And during that period, the company wanted to reinvest in plant and equipment to ensure that they could produce the high quality furniture uh, and materials for businesses and for offices and for hotels. I was always very impressed when I visited Dovetail in D Dundee about the high quality of commitment workmanship and product that was produced from that facility. And from that moment on, I was always persuaded that there was a role for supported business in society. 
Uh, it was interesting, Jenny Mara and her contributions seem to, seem to be suggesting, I may have got this wrong, Jenny Mara, but in some way that Stirling had been favoured over Dundee as far as Remploy was concerned, and, Dundee, and then the city of Dundee were not getting a fair share from um, the, the, the SNP. Well, I'm sure you're aware that since October 2013, uh, Dovetail has been delivering Dundee City Council, of course SNP runs, um, fund contract of supplier for beds, bedroom, lounge, dining and furniture, plus ancillary items, bedding and kitchen parts. parts. So actually, the SNP is doing a good job in Dundee with Dovetail. Now, later on, I was to become the Mid Scotland and Fife MSP and later the MSP for Stirling, and I got to know the Remploy operation well. I, I was also, similarly to the, rem, to the operation in, in Dovetail and Dundee, any time I visited the Remploy factory in Stirling, I was always highly impressed by the quality of product that was being produced for the army, for the military in general, for the ambulance service, for the nurses' uniforms, etc that were being produced there. Producing materials such as Kevlar vest for, for, you know, for the military and frontline real activity. Uh, and these people did a fantastic job. You know, many of them had been there many years, were highly skilled. And, and actually, if you think back to Scotland's more recent history in the textile industry, we've lo lost a lot of that skills. Mm -hmm. These skills now exist in places like, uh, or did exist in places like Remploy, but now in places like Haven. And it's something we should be thinking about building upon for the textiles to skills for the future in Scotland. Now, many colleagues will remember across the chamber, remember well the difficulties faced by disabled uh, people, particularly due to, I'm going to say to Gavin Brown, with, with respect to, to the UK government's decision to cease support for their employ factories. In terms of Stirling Remploy, I was involved in efforts to help to buy the buyers for the factory, and I was privileged to be included in the Minister's working group, along with the late Helen Edia, who others have mentioned, who was such a champion of Remploy. It is regrettable that the UK Government pursued its agenda in the way it did of removing support from the Remploy factories in Stirling and elsewhere. I have got to say, they showed a lack of care and respect about the impact that the sudden removal of that support would bring. Insufficient flexibility, I think, as Mike McKenzie, who is not in the Chamber at the moment, um, suggested was one of the issues. There wasn't enough time and space to allow the bidders to come forward to take on the management of some of these factories in a successful way. The factories, in effect, were being asked to compete and be involved and prove their worth were one hand tied behind their back. Now, that's a classic method of ensuring downsizing and failure. So it was pretty obvious to anyone who was outside this process looking in that there was only one agenda that was on the cards, and that was to ensure a closure of the facilities in the way they did it. Now, that has a human impact. And during the referendum campaign, I came across a number of um, former Remploy workers who had not been able to secure new employment, who, who previously in life could stand up tall, go to their work, feel good about themselves, have a worth and have dignity and feel good about the value they brought to society. And it was clear from the, 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 the contribution I had from these people that they had felt incredibly down, pushed down, they were depressed, they could not really work through the benefit system in the way they would have hoped to have done, and their lives had taken a turn for the worst. Now, that is a shame, and it did not have to happen in that way. However, in Stirling's case, I am pleased that Haven PTS was able to step in, take on the management of the former Remploy factory. Uh, Haven have now opened the business on October 2013. Yes, yeah, sure. Gavin Brown. I have to say, I think the member is making a thoughtful contribution. But given where we are now, does he think that the money should be taken away from individuals and put back towards institutions and supported workplaces? Mr Crawford. Gavin Brown, with all due respect, you've actually got that question the wrong way around. Because had they not taken it away in the first place, the money would still be there. So the question really is to you, if it's such a valuable, expert, a valuable way to go about business, should the government not find these additional resources if, if, that's, if that's what it's going to be? You can't suddenly reinvent it and take it back from these people. That's the problem. And you know it is. And you're being a wee bit mischievous when you do that. Through the chair, please. S sorry. I, I apologise, President Officer. Um, Haven opened for business in October 2013 with a headcount of 16 following the closure of the former Remploy business. 
However, in Haven's first year, it has been successful in establishing new business and growing sales, enabling it to expand its activities to over 32 em uh, employees. You know, some of these people have got 15 years' experience of manufacturing, very, very valuable experience that they can pass on to others. Even more encouraging, the, the, the company now anticipates further growth generated recently will require them to take on 20 more staff than they are currently recruiting, and it is hoped by Christmas the staff number will be 52, of whom 96 per cent are classed as disabled or facing complex barriers to work. And that is an organisation that is able to expand and grow in the way it has done. And during Haven PATS's first 12 months, because of that experience that they have got on the site, they have been able to bring in a work experience programme supported by the local job centre plus that has provided invaluable work experience for 30 unemployed individuals. So I take my hat off to that organisation yeah. and the way they are operating. Now, there is a minor downside to all this for me as the MSP for Stirling. It's such as the success of, and I can see my colleague Michael Matheson turning and smiling because you know, he knows what is coming now. Such is the success of Haven PTS, it now means it needs to expand and find larger premises. And as a result of that rapid and welcome growth we have seen over the last year, unfortunately I now see them shift out of my constituency into my colleague Michael Matheson's constituency, just a few miles from Stirling in Larbert. So actually, I'm while it's, a, a bit, uh, it's not great that it's not going to be in Stirling constituency, it would be churlish of me not to accept that this is a good thing and that they will be moving on to, to expand and have more jobs on the new site. And I know that the, my constituents who are currently employed at Haven PTS will be, in, will be benefiting, benefiting from the undoubted success story, uh, the example that services can be achieved. Now, this is because this is a well-run, efficient, supported, supported business. And the, with the last point that I would make, President Officer, one of the, 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 the things that you had success recently during the Commonwealth Games was they were able to produce 17,000 laundry bags for the Commonwealth Games activity. That just shows you if you can get into a new niche, that's now opened up new opportunities for them and other places to expand that sort of activity. And thank you for the extra time, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now call Richard Baker to be followed by Gil Patterson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, can I apologise for missing the start of the Minister's uh, opening and comments, but can I say that uh, I would agree with others that it's good we are again debating the future of supported businesses in Scotland, not just because they play a very important role in so many of our communities, as we've heard throughout this debate, but because this has been, as members have reflected, a traumatic few years for supported businesses and for the people employed in them, many of whom have now lost that employment, which was such a big part of their lives. In 2010, I led a member's debate on the subject of supporting Scotland's supported workplaces when there was a threat to the future of Glencraft in Aberdeen, which has provided employment for blind people in the city for over 140 years. Now, at that time, it was clear supported businesses already faced uh, huge challenges, although Glencraft uh, was saved, uh, I'm pleased to say. But I could not envisage then that the situation would deteriorate so quickly through the actions of the coalition government and the closure of so many Remploy factories. Many of us in this chamber were involved in the campaigns to save those factories, as Bruce Crawford just uh, mentioned his contribution, his involvement in the uh, future of the factory in Stirling. And I was involved, uh, like others, in the campaign to save the factory in Aberdeen, a campaign which was sadly unsuccessful, although Remploy's facilities and some of its employees were involved, along with Cornerstone, in the establishment of a new social enterprise, uh, Benahi, which is an upholstery business uh, and uh, has been a success. But so much else was lost with the closure of Remploy in Aberdeen. And we kept hearing from UK ministers that they would help those who lost their jobs at Remploy to find alternative employment. Uh, but uh, like Bruce Crawford's experience in the referendum campaign, uh, at the same time I met uh, with a former manager 
at the Aberdeen uh, factory, and his experience was that many of those workers, if actually the great majority of them, hadn't found jobs. So that theory of the, the money following these employees, in this instance certainly, just hadn't proved to, to be successful at all. So that was his experience, and I, sadly I think it would be the experience of very many um, uh, others who have been involved uh, in working in Remploy. So there's no doubt in my mind that the policy of the UK government towards supported uh, workplaces has been uh, deeply damaging. Uh, but so we must look also to what we can do here. And our motion states that there is more that public sector agencies Scotland can do uh, and more the Scottish Government can and should do, uh, as Jenny, Marie, uh, Jen, Jenny uh, Mara uh, rightly uh, pointed out in her uh, opening contribution for our side of the chamber. Now, and I agree it's right to acknowledge the Minister's uh, personal uh, involvement in this issue, and he spent a great deal of time uh, on it and been very involved. But what we are debating here is delivery, and, and still not enough is happening in terms of securing public sector contracts for these supported businesses. And yet again, we've rightly turned to the issue of procurement, uh, because it is a big weapon in the armoury of the Scottish Government, uh, which, if properly deployed, can make a real difference to important businesses like these. Now, the Minister has told us that progress is being made, but I believe more should have been done by the Scottish Government much earlier, back in 2010, when I raised these issues in the members' debate. And as Jenny Mara said earlier in her intervention, uh, you know, still more needs to be done now. The Minister says the Scottish Government will uh, make further progress, so we'll hold him uh, to that. But we've debated for years promoting these contracts, whether it be through the use of Article 19 in European legislation, or through the legislation we recently passed into law here on procurement reform, and I think Jenny Mann was absolutely right to talk about the uh, need for a, a further amendment of that legislation. So it's been debated a, a great deal, and it's now time to deliver on what has been uh, said. And um, Mr Mackenzie. Mike Mackenzie. I just wonder if, if Mr Baker uh, felt that it was a um, situation likely to give, deliver good government for Scotland, where the UK government punch holes in the roof and the Scottish government run around with buckets trying to catch the leaks. And in that sense, does he feel that Labour's submission to the Smith Commission, which proposes an extra half bucket for the Scottish Government, is any use at all? It should be. Uh, the, the damp sweep of a contribution there from uh, Mr Mackenzie, I have to say. I, I think it's not focusing on the real issue that we've got, uh, we've got here. And I think it's wrong to minimise. It's absolutely right to acknowledge the difficulties caused by the, the position the UK Government has taken on this issue, Mr Mackenzie. And, and, and uh, you know, starting with that, I've made that point clear in, in my contribution in my speech, but also it's wrong to minimise the impact procurement and effective procurement policy can have for these supported uh, businesses, because winning these contracts makes all the difference to them. Remploy and Aberdeen had developed links with Aberdeen University, through which it won contracts for work. Work carried out to a very high standard, which the university was very pleased with. So not only did it benefit the workers of Remploy, but it benefited the university as well. Now, if that flow of work from other contracts had been there, then it might be a different story then for Employ Aberdeen or indeed for Blindcraft in Edinburgh. Now, the Minister has been involved in this issue for a long time and he's right to praise the role of trade unions, of Lynn Turner and others. Uh, but Bruce Crawford was certainly right to mention the contribution of Helen Eady. And we'll all remember the passion with which she spoke about uh, supported uh, workplaces in this uh, chamber. She did a tremendous amount of work uh, on the Remploy group in this parliament, bringing all of us together to talk about the future of the factories in our areas. She worked closely with the Scottish Government on the issue to try and get the best results. She fought hard on behalf of the Remploy factory in Cowden Beef, and she again and again spoke up for these workers here in uh, this uh, chamber. She was passionate about what could be achieved uh, for uh, these workers by uh, their uh, being part of supported businesses and what could be achieved through the application of Article 19 uh, and through procurement policy. And in that debate in 2010, which I referred to earlier, she said, people who are disabled are not asking for handouts or grants. They are asking for the dignity of taking home a wage packet at the end of the week. That's what they want above all, and that is what they should be able uh, to get. And I think that really hits a nail on the head about these people. Uh, uh, it's, it's their future, their 
welfare we are, we are debating here today. If Ellen was here today uh, speaking in this debate now as I wish she was, she'd be encouraging us to be more ambitious in our support uh, that we give to these workers and these businesses. And, and I would agree with her, we could be more ambitious still. Many thanks. And I now call Gil Patterson to be followed by Nigel Dawn. Uh, thanks very much, Presiding Officer. I'm certainly indeed uh, pleased to be uh, speaking in this debate, and it, it, it is very important. Uh, and before I uh, begin, I must declare a constituent's interest in the debate itself as uh, one of the factories that has recently opened in the town of Clyde Bank, significantly in a factory formerly used by Remploy, which is uh, a, a very positive development for the local area. Since 2007, when being elected to represent people in Clyde Bank area, I have worked very closely with those involved in the Reploy uh, uh, factory, Remploy factory. Visiting the factory on a regular basis really brought home the passion that the workforce had for what they were doing and how high the quality of the goods that were produced on site. Now, I, I, I hear a range of goods that are mentioned today, but I'm, I'm quite sure the Chamber will be quite surprised to note that the Clyde Bank factory was actually manufacturing goods for the automotive industry. And I declare another interest because the business I own is, is heavily involved in, in the automotive industry. But the exacting standards required to deliver goods into that industry with the high expectations and safety is, is remarkable. And this, this unit delivered into the automotive industry on a commercial basis. However, despite the high quality of the goods and the valuable, valuable experience, uh, for those uh, employed, they live with constant bl the black cloud hanging over their operations with cutting of the staff numbers over some considerable years. Then in July 2013, they received the news that they were dreading. Remploy announced that it was closing a number of factories, including the Clyde Bank operation, in the second stage of cuts after the UK government decided that, and I quote, funding should be used to maximise employment for disabled people through individual support rather than subsidising organisations like Remploy. And I just pointed out how good this operation was, the kind of work that it was achieving. I think quite revolutionary that it had broken out the kind of public sector element of, a, of its operation. And it broke, broke into a very, very difficult uh, commercial area. But nevertheless, it was a, a, a de devastating blow that the great workforce, uh, many of whom were extremely worried about whether or not they would be able to secure employment ever in the future. And that's a quite a thing to have, to worry that you might never, ever be employed. And unfortunately, we're hearing that this is precisely what's happened so far. This was just another example of the callous attitude of the UK government towards those who need support instead of giving them the necessary support. They dumped them on the scrap heap or they offered them support in gaining employment into mainstream work. It's very laudable, but I think it's not possible for everybody in certain circumstances. The attitude completely failed to take into account the significant barriers that face disabled people to sustain a, a, a employment. The figure speaks for themselves, and members have already mentioned that the rate of dis disabled people in Scotland in April to June 2014 was 43.3% compared to a, an employment rate of 80.6% for non-disabled people. These figures speak volumes for themselves. Disabled people do not want special treatment when they're seeking employment. They just want to have this complex situations recognised and taken into account. At the time of the announcement of the closure of the Remploy factory in Clay Bank, the Scottish Government, who have consistently opposed the cuts agenda proposed by the UK Government, stepped into the breach in an attempt to alleviate the impact of this callous decision but the damage had already been done. However, since then, I am pleased to say, which is why I believe this is a very important debate, that the former Remploy site in Clyde Bank was purchased by Haven 
and after extensive renovation, it has recently reopened and is now a key component of the group's packaging operations. This is a very important, uh, this is very important news story for not only for the local community, but particularly for those who will be employed in the factory. And I congratulate all those involved in securing the future of the site, from the Scottish Government itself to the Western Bartonshire Council's economic development team, to those in Haven themselves. They have all proved that when there is a will, there is a way. This is an approach that should be commended local and national governments working to, together for the benefit of the people. I would also like to praise and thank Fergus Ewing uh, for the work that he carried out as a Minister for Enterprise, for all the hard work that he has put in in dealing with the situation. Through my experience and witness of campaigning with those affected by our employee closure, closures, I saw at first hand the dedication and that Fergus displayed in fighting for the rights of those workers and indeed for the factories eh, themselves. However, there is only so much that our government can do in Scotland to deal with issues such as these. How much easier would it be if we had full control over welfare? If we had full welfare powers, we could make the calculation on how much it would cost to lay disabled people off compared to making a small contribution to their continued employment. This would make the vital work they need viable if, in fact, if I had my accountant's hat on, then giving support in some cases would be a cheaper uh, option, whilst also being the best social uh, option. And I think members have pointed that, that out. Despite the limited powers available, I am pleased that the Scottish Government has introduced a policy and that every public body should have at least one contract with a supported business. This shows a united approach throughout the government uh, agencies. The National Framework Agreement, published in 2012, ensures that it is easier for public bodies to buy from supported businesses. These are approaches that will ensure the long-term feasibility of supported businesses, and I commend the Scottish Government for looking at the long-term solutions rather than the short-term fix. There will be challenges ahead, but with the Scottish Government committed to independent living and in complete opposition to the welfare cuts proposed by the Westminster Government, I am fully confident that supported businesses have a positive future for a long time ahead. And I commend this motion to Parliament. Many thanks. And finally, I call Nigel Dawn around seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Well, I have to say this has been an interesting debate. Um, I come at this from a slightly different angle, but very close to the one where my colleague Chick Brody started, because some 25 years ago, I was the technical manager for Unilever's detergents business in the UK, and we were buying production from one or two smaller manufacturers. But we had a requirement to get things packaged and sometimes repackaged and sometimes washed and reworked. And that was largely done by Remploy. Now, I have to be fair, that was along the M62 corridor, so I wasn't in Scotland at the time, and I'm not talking about Scottish businesses. But I did see firsthand what Remploy did. And I would endorse the view, firstly, put forward by Bruce Crawford about the quality, and he wasn't the only one to mention that, and the extremely experienced people that that business developed, I guess, uh, and was able to retain. But of course, the other thing that, that that business had was a flexibility, because it had a group of people who would turn their hands to pretty much anything. Um, it was just the nature of the way that business operated, and that meant that we could take them uh, a, a job more or less on the back of a lorry and be pretty sure that the following week it would be turned around and they'd have done what we needed them to do. Um, and so we had a long-term working relationship in that kind of way with Remploy, and it worked very, very well. Um, and also what I saw in that, and others have mentioned this as well, is that it's not just a factory where people go to work. It actually very quickly becomes a community, like any good workplace would, actually. And when you have a group of people who are looking for that little bit more support than probably we as individuals are, then actually what happens at work is enormously important. And some security in there and some continuity is, again, of huge value. 
And, and I would simply make the point, this isn't the first time I've made it in the chamber this year, that for the bean counters, this is actually a good thing to support. If you take away people who need social support in any sense at all from an environment when they're getting that support, then you are going to generate some costs for our health service and for our social services. And not only is there a cost in that, but you're actually taking away those limited resources from other activities. So on balance, these kind of things are worth doing in a simple economic sense, never minding the obvious social advantages of doing so. Now, if I can come on to the points that I think Jenny Mara um, has been trying, trying to make, and I'll, and I'll pick up on, on the, the other point as well in a, in a moment. Um, I think Jenny Mara would have got on rather better if, as, as my colleague had commented, she'd actually proofread her, 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 her um, amendment. Because actually, if it had picked up on the very large point that she's been trying to make about those public bodies that could reasonably, then you never know, it might have been supportable. But to say that absolutely everybody's got to have this contract is to invite the criticisms, which I think we, we've heard. But I would also make the point that if you come along, and I'll tell you in a moment, yeah, hang on. If you actually require a business to form a contract, which I would remind you is something that requires two people to agree and they're starting from different places, then you finish up with the risk that they would just get nominal contracts, which are actually very little value to anybody other than ticking the box that you've got them. Jenny Mara. I thank the member for giving way. Um, I think the SNP seem to have reneged on their commitment to this issue, because I'm just looking back at the debate from 2010 where the Minister Jim Mather for the SNP said, and I quote, we are working hard on our intention that every public sector body should have a contract with a supported employer using Article 19. We will bring forward a timetable for that. Yes. I think with respect to that intention is reflected in the government policy that we've heard. Whether that policy should be written down in a single line of a statute is the point that I've just addressed. And I think it actually runs the risk of simply being supported by a tick box process rather than actually by a sensible commercial process. And I think that, frankly, is the risk. Okay. Now, uh, if I can then come on to Gavin Brown's comments about the money following the individual or being put into the businesses. Could I simply suggest that what we've heard this afternoon demonstrates the obvious answer? It's actually both. It really is part of let's support businesses where those individuals who go into that business are getting sensible support, doing sensible commercial things, and actually it is economically sensible to subsidise that. And I take Cameron's point about um, subsidies being not necessarily sustainable forever, but actually our population is not suddenly going to run out of disabled people or people who have disabilities, I'm sorry, correct myself. Okay? Those businesses can be long-term, they were very long-term, they had subsidies in the long-term, and it was all very sensible. And to si decide for an ideological reason that suddenly we must stop doing that, everything must follow the individual into other businesses, has not worked. I don't even have to disagree on ideology. I've now got the economic argument. Comments from across the chambers. I too was standing beside Richard Baker in a very cold November or December morning outside Aberdeen. I mean, I remember it very distinctly. The utter frustration that ideology was closing a factory, which actually could have worked into the future, because I was in Aberdeen at the time. Okay? The answer is both. We can see that. Let's just get a sensible balance of this. Last point I would make is, and I'm sorry, I can't remember which of my colleagues I'm following on here, but the thought that there's some social responsibility in having these kind of businesses, and there's some social responsibility in contracting with these kind of businesses. Now, I remember in the days when I sat on Dundee, uh, was a member of Dundee City Council, I sat on their pension funds committee, that we actually talked to the businesses in which, some at least, of the businesses in which we invested, and these were pretty large sums of money, and ask them about their social policies and their commitment to the environment. Now, that was pretty nominal, to be honest, in those days. That is something which is growing in importance, and people are taking it more and more seriously. I think there is an opportunity for our pension funds and large investment funds to actually ask this kind of question. These kind of social businesses do need support where it's appropriate, and those who could procure things from them should be being asked whether they are even trying to do so. Because frankly, if they're not even trying, then somebody should be asking them to change their attitude. I suspect, presiding officer, that my time is up, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Many thanks. Yes, indeed, we now turn to the closing speeches, and I call on Gavin Brown up to seven minutes, please.
Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think this has been a, a very good debate, I have to say. And I want to focus my closing remarks on two main issues. The first one is the one contract policy, and the second one is the conclusion reached by the SACE review, which I think underpinned all of the UK coalition government action, as opposed to some of the incentives and suggestions put forward by members from the SNP today. We turn first to the one contract policy. I have to say I'm a, I'm a little disappointed that not a single SNP backbencher was prepared to challenge the government on this issue. Not a single one of them was prepared to even comment on it other than to tie themselves in knots as to why it's actually a good policy, but it doesn't matter that they're actually not achieving it. We've heard the excuse from the Minister that uh, some public bodies might not need them. In which case, why do you have this policy and why have you had this policy since 2009? We had the Bruce Crawford excuse that actually, if every public body had a contract, then the supported businesses simply couldn't cope. Uh, but in his own contribution, he gave an excellent example of a supported business in his constituency for now that clearly was able to cope with an enormous contract and there's no reason why the other supported businesses couldn't cope if every public body did decide to uh, sign a contract. And then the uh, rather facile excuse from Stuart Stevenson that because he doesn't think the Water Industry Commissioner uh, requires uh, a lot of furniture, then that suddenly excuses every other uh, public body that doesn't currently have a contract. It was disappointing that, that not a single member was prepared to challenge the front bench and perhaps they can redeem themselves in closing speeches with the Minister to find out how many public bodies today have not yet uh, signed a contract. Happy to, to give way. Stuart Stevenson. Um, it, it's interesting to hear uh, the Tories defending the Labour Party again in the construction of their amendment. The point about the Water Industry Commissioner for Scotland is, of course, the general one that you have to look at the individual circumstances of each and every body. Perfectly proper that it be mandated that they look at the opportunities they each and every one have for buying from supported businesses. Absolutely impossible to mandate that they must complete a contract because the WICs, and there will be others, simply will have limited opportunities. Gavin Brown. Well, I ask him simply back then, in his view, does every other public body who hasn't yet signed a contract is a conclusive proof that none of them actually need any of the items produced by supported businesses. I'm quite sure that's not the case, but it appears that the Scottish Government haven't even done their homework and they simply don't know. The Minister wasn't able to answer the basic question. And as for uh, defending the Labour Party, we don't actually agree with the Labour Party on this. We don't think it should be in statute, but we do think the government ought to be doing more. Given that it's been a policy in place for five years, I think they could have done a bit more. And I think they ought to be able to tell us at least what the position is on the ground and what they're going to do to try and improve the situation. Uh, but Deputy President, of the second issue I want to, uh, to finish on or to, to, uh, to focus on is this. The idea put forward by a number of members here that the reasons uh, for deciding to close the Remploy factories and to try and transfer funding to the individual uh, was one uh, that showed an icy lack of compassion, uh, shut without care. It was all about cutting. It was all about uh, being callous. I refute that absolutely, Deputy Presenting Officer. And I say to those members, please go and read the SACE review. Please read the review that underpinned the reforms put forward by the coalition government, because it is a thoughtful piece of work. It is a far-reaching piece of work. And yes, in parts, it is a painful piece of work. There is no question that the report acknowledged some of the pain that would be caused by this, but it was done for reasons of principle and pragmatism. The conclusion reached by the SACE report was that the model of employment support needs to change so that it meets disabled people's aspirations is based on evidence, is fit for the future, and serves far more people than it does today. It was built on a principle of those with disabilities getting into work, staying in work, and then ultimately getting on in work. It was based on principle and pragmatism, the pragmatism that government funding should be spent where it can have the most impact. And they concluded that there was a significant scope to increase the number of people who could benefit. If we look at the numbers, Deputy Presiding Officer, the budget, let, let, let me develop this point, uh, Mr. Crawford. The budget spent on this uh, issue was £333 million. 
of which £63 million each year was going on Remploy factories. So about a fifth of the budget was going on the Remploy factories, but it was the cost per head that was proving a challenge. The cost per head in the Remploy factories was £25,000. Whereas if that were to be transferred to the individual, Remploy themselves, another division of Remploy, as Cameron Buchanan made and commented in his contribution, they believe they could help three or four people with that same amount of funding. It's about raising the appalling level of employment statistics, which everyone in this chamber wants to do something about. But by focusing the efforts on the individual, we can get far more people into work. I said I would give way to Bruce Crawford. Bruce point, Crawford. I, 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 I genuinely believe that Gavin Brown <coughs> believes that that's what was trying to be achieved. I don't under, under, uh, underestimate what he's saying. But the UK Minister of State for Disabled People confirmed on the 15th of October this year that of the people who had been previously employed in Remploy, 1,507 were still looking for another job. So despite this issue about the money supposed to be following the people, all these people were still looking for another job. Only 774 were able to find work. It proves, Gavin Brown, that while the theory might be there, in practice, it simply hasn't worked for these people. They are facing Gavin the misery Brown. of these decisions. I'm afraid you're De concluding. De Deputy Reinhofer, I accept it hasn't worked for some people. Ab absolutely right. But I make two, two comments in response to that. The, the, first, the, first one, the first one is this, Deputy Presenting Officer. Remploy's employment services have found jobs for 35,000 people over the last two years whereas the factories employed approximately 2,400 people. And the government never said that every single person would get a new job overnight. This is a series of reforms that will take time. They will take time to achieve everything. But ultimately, if we want to increase dramatically the number of people with a disability in work, then the idea of funding flowing towards the individual I think makes economic sense and practical sense too. It was based, just in closing then, also though on a, on a, on a degree of principle, it wasn't just about the bean counters. Uh, Liz uh, says, spoke to thousands of stakeholders, spoke to disabled people with disabilities across the country, and they said this, I want the same choice as anyone else to have the career I want. Again and again, disabled people, especially young people, said they wanted the same chance of getting the full range of roles in the economy as everyone else. Ultimately, presenting officer, it was about the types of support that could help today's young disabled people, that, the type of support that they will want in tomorrow's economy. That's why, uh, while the principles were painful for some, in practice and in the long term, we think they were the right decision. Thank you. And I call on Jenny Mara, maximum nine minutes. Presiding officer, um, I think this has been a good and interesting debate, but somewhat, I think, uh, lacking in ambition and innovation. I think a framework for supported business does not really go far enough to meet the needs and aspirations of our young and experienced workers in Scotland who uh, live with their disabilities and want, like Gavin Brown said, to have fulfilling uh, careers. And it is Labour's vision for modern workplaces, sheltered workplaces, where workers who have worked for years can, can work there but share their skills, not just with disabled workers, but from some of our young people who we know from our youth employment statistics and all of our visits to youth employment projects across the country. These young people who are so far from the labour market, who have lived chaotic and uh, difficult childhoods, who have come are far from the labour market and could do with actually starting their careers in a sheltered modern workplace and then moving on as they've learnt their skills to the mainstream workplace. It is modern sheltered workplaces with innovative solutions like that and blending the talents of disabled workers with experience with our workers who need that nurture and support. That is our vision for the future of sheltered workplaces in Scotland. That is a vision that I hope we will get the chance to implement in 2016. But I do feel from this debate this afternoon 
that the Scottish Government is really lacking any of that ambition to make this happen. The motion this afternoon is very much around their uh, framework. And I, I, made, I said in my intervention to Nigel Don anyway that we've been here, as Gavin po Brown pointed out before, we were here four years ago now, before I was here, debating this very issue about the SNP's framework, but not nearly enough progress have been, has been made. Gavin Brown has pointed out to the Scottish Government this afternoon that they don't seem to be on top of the figures about the amount of public authorities in Scotland who have not awarded a contract. I can tell the Scottish Government this afternoon that it is at least 40 public bodies, and that was 40 public bodies who had the information and were able to tell us that they have able to tell SPICE that they have not awarded one single contract under the framework for supported business. So to go back to Jim Mather's comments in 2010, we are working hard on our intention that every public sector body should have a contract with a supported employer using Article 19, and we will bring forward a timetable for that. I would ask the Minister in closing today exactly how hard is this government working on that? Since the Freedom of Information request, which many people have cited, that was done in April this year, only an additional four public bodies have placed a contract with a supported business. The progress is slow, it is sluggish, and it doesn't uh, really reflect some of the warm words from the government this afternoon. And you know, presiding officer, it is baffling to me that the SNP government, who spent the whole referendum campaign promising the earth, cannot even say to public authorities in this country that they should place one contract with supported business. Now, we have heard a number of arguments from the SNP benches this afternoon about why public authorities should not be compelled. And I think that is the Minister's problem with this, it is legislating to make it happen. We've heard arguments why they should not be compelled to place contracts with supported businesses. Now, Mike McKenzie said that Scottish Government should not tell local authorities what to do because it's centralisation. Mike McKenzie might want to reflect on the fact that the Scottish Government tell local authorities every year to freeze their council tax, but they cannot tell them, they're not prepared to tell them, to place a contract with a sheltered workplace. It's frankly baffling. Yeah. Mike McKenzie. What, what I was uh, pointing out, uh, the member might care to reflect, that it's Labour Party that accuse the this government of centralisation, whenever we try to uh, use uh, legislation or, or, or other powers to um, in, 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 insist that local authorities do certain things. Generally speaking, the Labour Party argue against this. Why in this situation are you arguing for it? Jenny Mara. Disabled workers deserve it. I would say to Mike McKenzie, and this is on one point where we are prepared to argue for this, to put that on the statute book, to make sure that public procurement is working for the benefit of disabled workers across this country. And let me come on to the criticisms of the Labour Party in this debate, because we have been criticised this afternoon that for the fact that some of our councils have said that my amendment is not necessary. Firstly, can I say to this that many of these councils, including Glasgow and North Lanarkshire, are already making substantial investment in supported business, so they know that they are doing it anyway. Secondly, I will commit to winning that debate in my party for the amendment to the Public Procurement Act with those local authority council leaders if the Minister will commit to enacting it. Because I would be very surprised if this SNP government would actually let Labour councils stop them from doing something that they really want to do and they really want and they really believe in. Presiding officer, Stuart Stevenson said that Scottish Water don't buy anything that supported businesses in Scotland make. Well, I, I, he can clarify for me. Stuart Stevenson. It's just a factual correction. The Water Industry Commissioner for Scotland, not Scottish Water. Jenny Mara. Well, I am absolutely convinced that that commissioner has a desk, he has drawers that he puts his papers in, and he has office furniture, which are made by supported businesses 
in Scotland. So I think he could put the contract for his future office furniture with him. I think Stuart Stephen makes a spurious point, and quite frankly, presiding officer, it is really quite baffling the splitting here arguments that the SNP have come up with this afternoon against legislating for a wholly morally justified policy. Yes. Mike McKenzie, briefly, as the minutes approach, uh, members approaching the last minute. Would you consider that uh, the terms of your amen amendment would be fulfilled if uh, um, a public authority bought one paper clip um, from a supported business? Because the, the, what, what you're suggesting is not workable in real terms. Jenny Mara, apologies, you officer, do quite, still have more time. Presiding officer, quite frankly, I think that's the most ridiculous point, and I think it is embarrassing. I think it is embarrassing for this government. What we are saying is that every public authority in this country should place one, at least one, public contract with a supported business to support disabled workers. It is something that Jim Mather, one of your ministers, said was um, a good thing to do. It is something that is wholly and morally justifiable. It would support sheltered workplaces across, across this country. It would put more disabled and young people far from the labour market into work. I am very surprised that the SNP shows such resistance to a progressive policy. I move the amendment in my name and I thank for this good debate this afternoon. Thank you very much. And I now call on Michael Matheson to wind up the debate. Minister, you have until 5pm. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I think uh, uh, this has been a, a very useful debate with a, a number of very thoughtful uh, uh, and considered uh, contributions uh, to the debate and to the whole issue of employment for uh, disabled people. I actually am um, uh, I feel as though there is actually more points of agreement in the debate uh, than probably has been recognised at points from some of the contributions. And I don't wish to lose sight on that point. And I think what we need to do is to make sure that we build on the areas of agreement, which we have, but I think we also have to recognise that there are some differences of view uh, on areas uh, around this matter of policy. I recognise the point that Jenny uh, Mara is making around the issue of uh, making it mandatory for all local authorities to place at least one contract uh, with a supported uh, uh, workshop uh, environment. Can I say that um, although I think we should always be very careful in thinking that by identifying a simplistic single solution to the issue, it will in some way address what is a much more fundamental issue around supported employment and supported uh, workplaces. And although I recognise that Jenny Mara, with all the best of intentions, wishes to try and achieve the best for those supported uh, workplaces, we need to take, for this, take this forward in an approach which will allow us to create a sustainable approach for successful disabled workplaces. And I believe that the approach that we are taking as a government is setting out why we wish to take the approach we are. And I also think that a number of those who have contributed to the debate, for example, Bruce Crawford, have already highlighted the real difficulties there would be in taking the approach that Jenny Mara has outlined. But I can say there is an area where I do agree with Jenny Mara, and that is her ambition to see modern supported workplaces for disabled uh, people. Can I also say to uh, Gavin Brown, who again he raised the issue about the uh, placing of uh, contracts with the uh, with uh, uh, supported uh, employment uh, businesses. Can I say that there are a number of complexities around this? There are a number of complexities because not all of the contracts go through the public procurement portal system. Some of them are through subcontracts as well. And there is a whole range of complexity around being able to monitor and measure those contracts that are being placed. But what I can say to the member and give him an assurance of is that we are determined to look at seeing how we can actually get much greater detail around how those contracts are being placed and when they're being placed and who they're being placed by as well. But I don't want to give the impression that that's something that can be easily achieved because of the complexity of some of the subcontracting that gets on in this process. But we are intending, and our procurement team are intending, to look at what they can do through the IT system 
in order to be able to monitor this issue much more effectively. And as a government, if that monitoring demonstrates a need for further intervention from our point of view in encouraging uh, and uh, working with uh, public contracts to encourage them uh, to place more contracts with uh, uh, supported employment employers, then we will be prepared to do that, as we have been doing for the last uh, couple of years. But can I also say, I'll give way to the member, yes. Gavin Brown. I'm grateful for his remarks. So, but it, is it as complex, though, as he makes out? Because when the FOI was put in, a very clear answer was given back, that there were 44 out of 118 uh, that hadn't signed contracts. So if the information was possible via FOI in, in 21 days or whatever it is, surely it's not as quite as complex as he was making out. Minister. Not all, of these, uh, not all of these contracts have been placed through Article 19, uh, for example. So there are other issues that have to be considered and been able to actually get a proper picture, a fuller picture um, of the detail. But can I also say, I think there is a, there is a real danger that we are looking at this thing from the, diff the wrong perspective. Because the focus shouldn't be just about on public sector contracts being awarded to supported employers. It should actually be about making sure the supported employers we have are successful in being able to actually gain contracts, not just from the public sector, but also from the private sector, and to do that in a way that allows them to be ambitious and to be able to produce goods that they can take to market and that they're in a position where they can be a sustainable business. That's, about, that's the approach that we as a government are determined to take. And just to give you an example of how we're taking that forward, my college, colleague at Bruce Crawford made reference to the changes that have happened in Stirling with the Remploy factory there now moving to my constituency in Larbert. Moving to Larbert in order to be able to take on new work in an environment which is modern, sophisticated. It has had £1.7 million of Scottish Government investment put into it to allow them to support them to become a successful business and to be able to actually market their goods in a successful way and to be able to also train those who work with them in a way that allows them to either remain there in employment or to move on in employment. And that's a partnership in Larbert, my constituency, that I think demonstrates the approach that allows this to be taken forward in a sustainable, successful way. A partnership between the Scottish Government, Haven, Scottish Enterprise and Falkirk Council. And I've got no doubt that that will continue to be a success and able to build on what is a £1.5 million per annum contract they now have with the NHS in Scotland. And I think we also heard from Maureen Watt and her contribution about the way in which Blindcraft and our own constituency have been able to engage and to move on from the situation that they were in when there were real difficulties several years ago in order to turn the business around, in order to make it sustainable and potentially successful. But can I also say as well, I think part of the issue about the point that Gavin Brown and some others were making about should we now take the money away from those individuals and put it back into the businesses is not really the way we should be looking at this matter. One is not mutually exclusive to the other. Business support for disabled people is equally important as supported employment is. The problem with the UK Government's approach was that it had to be supported employment in a place of employment with the employer, but supported workplaces were not of value. That was the problem with the UK Government's approach. It was one or the other. And we then found ourselves in a situation, as has been rightly highlighted by Bruce Crawford, where we have 1,500 1, people who were previously employed by Remploy no longer employment. They are unemployed, right. receiving benefit to support them right. in their position because of the difficulties that they now face. Had the UK Government taken a different approach to this whole matter, yes, recognising that support and employment is important, but also that business employment support for disabled people is also of equal value, then we could have taken an entirely different approach. And I think the problem with the UK Government's approach is it's been a one-size-fits-all approach which doesn't work in this area. And I'll give Gavin way Brown. to the member. Does the, member not, does the Minister not accept the conclusions of the SACE review that demonstrated if you could help three or four people for the same amount of money, then that has to be looked at and that has to be the way forward? Minister. The SACE review wasn't about doing one thing and ruling out the other. It was no, it wasn't simply about that, and that's the problem with the UK government's approach: is it's chosen to interpret it in such a way that it's decided that they do not value supported work placements, and that's why that's why they've run into such difficulty, and that's why two thirds of those who previously were employed by Remploy now find themselves in unemployment. 
But let's put this whole issue in some context, because I think it's really important that we, we do that. Maureen Watt made that particular point in her own contribution. Employment rates for those with a disability in Scotland during April to June of this year was 43.3 per cent. For non-disabled people during the same period, it was 80.6. An employment rate, an unemployment rate for disabled people at the same time was 14.6 per cent. And for non-disabled people, it was 5.5 per cent. It's that employment opportunity, that lack of opportunity, that causes the gap in terms of people's relative income. It's that type of gap that causes inequality that so many disabled people experience, that loss of self-esteem, that loss of confidence, and find themselves caught in the benefit trap as well. And it's why we need to make sure that we take an, a balanced approach, not only about supporting those who want supported employment, but also supporting those businesses that can help to support those disabled people who want to have employment as well. Can I also, uh, President Officer, uh, turn to some of the other issues in the time that remains uh, to be able to highlight that the approach that we as a government are taking is much more ambitious than the approach that Jenny Mara suggests, that our ambition should be that we want to have each public body plays one contract with a support, a disabled uh, a support uh, business. Our approach is to create equality for disabled people, equality of opportunity, so that they can get employment no matter what their circumstances are. And I thought Siobhan McMahon made an extremely good, uh, an extremely good speech in highlighting a number of these issues, some of the points which have already been taken forward by the Scottish Government in our youth support its strategy. We already have Skills Development Scotland looking at how we can make sure that we increase the number of those young people with a disability are able to participate within our apprenticeship scheme. We have also got Reemploy Employment Services in Bernardo's working with Skills Development Scotland to also look at how we can enable more disabled people to be able to engage in employment as well. And to take it beyond that, as a government, we have also set out a range of measures to help to support those with a disability into employment through our Keys to Life, our Learning Disability, National in the last Strategy, 30 seconds, could our Mental Health Strategy, our Autism Strategy. And as a government, we will continue to take forward policies in a positive way to support disabled people. Sign officer, this has been a very useful debate. But one thing I can assure the Chamber is that we as a government will continue to do everything we can to help to support disabled people to ensure they get the opportunity, the equal opportunity to employment here in Scotland. Thanks, Minister. That concludes the debate on supported business. We now move to the next item of business, which is decision time. The first question is amendment number 11332.2 in the name of Jenny Mara, which seeks to amend motion number 11332 in the name of Fergus Ewing on supported business be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cancel the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11332.2 in the name of Jenny Mara is as follows. Yes, 31. No, 74. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 11332.1 in the name of Gavin Brown, which seeks to amend motion number 11332 in the name of Fergus Ewing on supported prisons be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast the votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 1132.1 in the name of Gavin Brown is as follows: Yes, 15; No, 90. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 1132 in the name of Fergus Ewing on supported business be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament has not agreed. Let us move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 11332 in the name of Fergus Ewing is as follows. Yes, 90. No, 15. There were no abstention. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. I now close this meeting.